news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. If you want your news to be straight talking, this is the nightmare for the Conservatives again. Down to earth. It's not just Nottingham where this is happening, is it? And most importantly, honest. Hard-working, middle-class taxpayers, they'll get their book thrown at them. Then catch me, Martin Daubney, Monday to Friday, 3 to 6 p.m. on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Stephen Dixon, and thanks for joining us on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good morning to you. Six o'clock, Friday the 19th of April. Today, the world holds its breath as US sources claim that Israel has launched an attack on Iran in a retaliatory strike, with reports of explosions near a military base in Isfahan. Iranian state media downplay the attack as the news agency claims the country's nuclear facilities are completely secure. As a senior commander tells them, no damage was done. Well, that's as Tehran warned of a severe and immediate response to any Israeli attack as the country activates its air defence systems. Meanwhile, Western governments tell its citizens to leave Israel over fears of a reprisal attack as Tehran grounds commercial flights. And in the sport this morning, Emmy Martinez's antics in goal. See Aston Villa go through on a penalty shootout to the Europa Conference League semi-final. Liverpool and West Ham go out of the Europa League, which is not good for the coefficient. Uh, and the FA Cup's changing, and people are not happy about this. It's going to be a sunny start to the weekend for many of us as higher pressure finally arrives. But before we get there, Today is another day of bright spells and showers. I'll have the full details in the forecast coming up shortly. Morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello, and this is Breakfast on GB News. So we start with breaking news in the last hour or so, and Israel has reportedly launched an attack on Iran overnight in a retaliatory strike, with reports of explosions near a military base in Isfahan, and that's according to US officials. Yes, Iranian state media have been quick to downplay the situation, claiming their air defence systems were able to destroy three drones in the centre of the country. Now, we yet to get any official statement from Israel on the attack. Well, meanwhile, the Australian government has urged its citizens to leave Israel over fears of a revenge attack by Iran. Let's talk to our security editor, Mark White, who joins us now. Morning, Mark. What do we know at this stage? Morning. Well, we are still waiting uh, on any official word from Israel as to what this 
uh, attack was, whether of course it was Israel, or we suspect it was, as it's being widely reported by US media that the Israeli government informed the US government that they were about to launch these attacks. Um, they seem to, uh, from what we are hearing, be limited in nature. Air defence systems activated in a number of Iranian provinces, including in Istifan, that uh, one of Iran's largest cities in central Iran. It appears to be focused near an air base. Uh, we understand that the 8th uh, wing or fighter wing of the Iranian Air Force uh, is based on an air base. There's a number of air bases in that area. It's also home to some of Iran's nuclear facilities, although there's no indication that any of those nuclear facilities were targeted. Uh, there are reports that some of Iran's uh, drone uh, manufacturing capability is based near Istifan. Um, so we await to see really just what has been targeted and what the damage has been. As you said in your introduction there, the Iranian state broadcaster has been downplaying these attacks, saying that they were easily dealt with by Iran's uh, air defence systems that managed to take out uh, three drones. But, as I say, we're getting reports of some other explosions uh, and activations of air defence systems in some other provinces as well. Mark, I mean, it is early. It's important to stress that. But from what we know so far, this isn't a strike on civilians. So for Israel, given the range of options, this does seem to be on the lower end of the scale in terms of a response to what we saw on Saturday night. No, and you wouldn't expect that Israel would be uh, striking civilian areas as such. It, any strike that Israel was to carry out would be uh, aimed potentially at military regime targets, the possibility of Iran's nuclear systems. And certainly it makes sense if it is targeting the drone uh, manufacturing capabilities as well, because, of course, there were 170 drones at least that were fired uh, from Iran towards Israel on Saturday night. And really since then, since 331 drones, crews and ballistic missiles were taken down, not just by Israeli forces, but also uh, coalition partners, if you like, in the sense that, uh, that the US came to their aid, also the UK, France uh, and Jordanian uh, Air Force planes, as well as Saudi Arabia. So a number of countries that intervened to help Israel defend itself from those attacks. We had been waiting since those attacks took place on Saturday night for the uh, likely response from Israel. Uh, we had heard, of course, from the UK government, the US government and others calling on Israel uh, not to retaliate, to take the win effectively. Uh, no one ever really thought that Israel would not respond uh, to some extent uh, to this very significant attack on its soil. Well, now it seems uh, we have a response. Now, the big question here is, was this an initial uh, targeting of sites uh, in Iran to be followed up by further attacks? Was it always designed to be limited uh, in nature um, so as not to escalate the, si the situation further? Um, and any other response from Israel may not be direct attacks on Iran. Only the hours ahead might tell that when we get some indication from the Israeli government. They have said nothing thus far. That might be an indication that what they are planning is not over yet. I think from Iran's point of view, not only is their state broadcaster playing down this, uh, but we're also hearing that the aviation uh, authority in Iran has opened some of the airspace around some of the airports in the, the country again. So the mood music, I think, coming from Iran is a bit different from what they were saying really just hours ago when they were saying any attack from Israel would be met with uh, an immediate and massive response from Iran. Well, there has been no immediate response from Iran, that's for sure. We're not seeing any alerts over Israel this morning, and it's 8 o'clock in the morning in Israel uh, and nothing yet. So 
Uh, as I say, so much is unknown here, and we just have to wait and see when we finally get that confirmation from the Israeli government as to what exactly they were intending here. OK, uh, Mark, for now, thanks very much indeed. Let's talk to former British Army spokesperson, uh, Major Mike Shearer, who joins us now. Mike, can I get your assessment on what we're seeing, particularly from Iran, in all of this? I mean, as Mark was saying there, that they're playing it down, they appear to have reopened some airspace. I mean, it, it, is this, a, from an Iranian perspective, are they trying to de-escalate this a little bit rather than come back with that massive response they'd been threatening? I think that's exactly right. Um, I think Israel have actually been very restrained in their response. Uh, you mentioned earlier that they didn't target uh, people. They didn't target the capital. Uh, Isfahan is some uh, four hours drive south of the capital. So they've gone for a military installation. So I think Israel, despite what they will be saying, have listened to uh, the president of uh, the US. They have tempered their response. Um, whether or not they will do more, we, we will have to wait and see. But they didn't involve people. Uh, and I think that's important. You know, Israel see every loss of innocent life as a tragedy. I think that Iran and their proxies, like Hamas, um, they see it as a strategy. So I think Israel has been very restrained about their response, and I think, therefore, uh, Iran can calm down on the back of that. I mean, that's the question, isn't it? Because what really matters in all of this now is how the Iranians will see all of this and what their response will be next. Well, that's right. Um, they did say they would go hard as soon as there was a response. Well, that hasn't happened, but it is early hours. Let, let's just be clear about that. Uh, they could be gathering their thoughts, but um, I think the mood music as we see it is probably the de-escalation is now occurring. Well, that gives um, everyone a little bit of, of, of breathing space, doesn't it? And, and, I mean, particularly countries like the United States, but also the UK, of course, because you know, we, we, we have committed, haven't we, to, to doing what we can... Uh, to protect Israel should another strike come? I think that's right. And I, I, I think it is time now for uh, the friends of Israel um, to come together and do whatever they can to, to shore up that response, that, that safety blanket, if you like. Um, I think the mealy mouthed words of we're not going to be with you if you, if you respond doesn't help anyone. I think people need to know where people stand on this. And let's be clear, Israel have been reactive on every occasion uh, since the 7th of October. Um, they haven't been proactive. And on that basis alone, uh, I think uh, the friends of Israel really need to stand up now and do what they can, even if it, even if it is only signaling uh, by word of mouth that we are with you, and they should be. What do we know about Iran's nuclear program and how concerned do you think we should be about that if we're going to be seeing tit-for-tat strikes taking place here? Well, I mean, this is very worrying. And is, uh, Isfahan is the centre of Iran's nuclear program. Um, I would say that the world should be very worried if Israel, I beg your pardon, if Iran developed that nuclear uh, strength that can then threaten uh, nation states around the planet. Um, so the fact that the fact that, that Israel have made a strike on that sends out a signal, I think. Um, and I think that you know the planet should be behind them. Uh, I don't think that the, I think the Saudis will be happy enough for that response. I think the other Sunni nations uh, like Egypt, Oman, the UAE, and others. I think they will be reasonably um, settled by uh, Israel's response this morning. OK, Mike Shearer, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let's try and get a US perspective on this, because obviously the United States are a key player, key ally of Israel. A US political analyst, uh, Dr Roger Gewalb, joins us. Roger, 
Good to Good see morning. you this morning. I mean, would you agree with what Major Shearer was saying there, that it, it would seem, at least, that uh, Israel has listened to what the White House has said, has listened to President Biden, and has, well, responded, but in a, in a, a very tempered response? Yes, well, I, I don't think they particularly listened to, to Joe Biden or necessarily anyone else. I think they've made their own decision. Um, uh, as Mark said, we don't know what, if anything, is coming next. Uh, but this was a very measured response. Um, uh, and so it's more messaging. Isfahan, uh, uh, as the major said, is the home to the Iranian nuclear program. Uh, in December, I, along with a lot of other people, uh, announced on American television that uh, Iran was a week away from having a nuclear capability, so they must have that by now. Um, and I think Israel was sending a message, and the second part of the message, Stephen, was that, of course, Isfahan is the home of the factory that made the drones that uh, were flown at Israel on Saturday. So it was, it was a very measured response. Um, I think that the foreign minister of Iran's statement that any attack will be met by something much more massive needs to be paid attention to. Uh, analysts uh, in America, such as the former director of national intelligence, feels that they will uh, retaliate disproportionately um, and that the messaging phase is over and there could very well be uh, an escalation at this point. Roger, our understanding from a senior U.S. official is that the U.S. had advance warning of this strike, uh, but they, they did say they didn't endorse the response. The U.S. will be really, really careful now not to implicate themselves in any of this at all. Well, I, I think they'll probably be implicated anyway. My guess, my hunch uh, is that um, the Iranians will probably find some way to implicate them so that either directly or more likely uh, through their proxies, the U.S. military bases in Iraq and Syria become fair game, become uh, targets now at this point. I mean, it's, do, you, do you think we, the, the international community is still holding its breath, Roger? After, I mean, there's been so much concern about how quickly this could escalate. The fact, as you say, measured response, the fact that, that Iran and Tehran seems to be playing this down, do you think we, we could be all right or should we still be hugely concerned? Well, I, I think we could be all right, but I think we should remain concerned. It's been described by some uh, U.S. sources as um, something of a humiliation for Iran that uh, Israeli fighter jets apparently were able to enter Iranian airspace a couple of hours ago, something the Iranians were unable to do with Israel. Uh, the fact that they've sent this message next door to where their nuclear production uh, exists and where the drones were made, um, a lot of messages sent there. And so Iran will probably feel that they they must retaliate. The position of the uh, the mullahs and the ayatollahs in Iran uh, is described as somewhat weakened and they need to show strength. Um, so they will probably do something. Uh, let's hope it's not on a massive basis. Let's hope it's uh, tit for tat. But uh, some of the experts do feel that that phase is over and that their response will be greater. And I would imagine that the Israelis are waiting to see what that is before deciding what, uh, if anything, to do next. OK, Roger. Thanks very much indeed. Well, Middle East security analyst Seth Fransman joins us now. Good to see you this morning, Seth. And what's your assessment of what we've seen in the past few hours? Well, it does appear that, you know, there has been some sort of incidents in Iran, but I think it's clear that the Iranian regime is downplaying it, and it does seem that although, you know, media is indicating that Israel carried out some sort of retaliation or what have you, I think that we'll probably hopefully see some sort of de-escalation because in the end of the day, Iran attacked Israel with 350 missiles and drones, which is unprecedented attack. So 
I think Israel had to show that it's willing to do something, but I think that it's not in anyone's interest to see it escalate into a wider regional conflict. You think, why do you think, Seth, that, that um, Iran is playing it down following the pre its previous rhetoric? Well, the Iranian regime has spent, you know, the last decades or so pretending that it is on the winning side. It basically is always messaging that Israel and the United States are losing and that the United States is leaving the region, that Israel is under siege and Israel is about to fall apart. So if you spend many years as an authoritarian regime messaging that your enemy is weak, and that you are on the offensive everywhere in the region. And then all of a sudden, it turns out that, in fact, I think what many people know, which is the Iranian regime is a bit of a paper tiger. It's not as strong as it portrays itself. I think that that would be incredibly harmful to the regime to admit that it can't defend its own airspace. So it has to pretend that it can defend its airspace, because especially that would be embarrassing, considering the fact that Israel had intercepted, along with the Americans, 99% of the drones and missiles that Iran attacked Israel with. And Iran shows, I mean, Iran is claiming this morning that it was attacked by a few small miniature drones. If it claims that it can't even stop that, then how can it stop something more serious? Mm. Uh, what can we read into the fact that Israel has not said anything yet? Could it possibly be an indication that this isn't over yet? Well, it's certainly, yeah, it's an indication on the one hand that, you know, Israel, of course, reserves the right to continue its, any sort of response. I mean, this is, it's obvious that this is an open conflict in the sense that Iran openly attacked Israel. However, I do think the indications in U.S. media this morning, the reports to ABC and other places that basically had indicated that there had been an attack, would, it, would seem to show that there is some acknowledgement a bit on the Israeli side. <clears throat> um in, in terms of how this will be viewed by um, other anti-Israeli powers in the region, what do you think? I mean, because the I mean the issue with this is not just Iran; it's it's the 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 proxies of Iran that are operating in the region, including Hezbollah. I mean, it, it, is there a case that perhaps Iran is going to? you know, respond using proxies? Is Israel likely to attack proxies? I mean, what's your assessment moving forward on that front? Well, first of all, the proxies have already been attacking Israel for years, and also since October 7th with the Hamas attack, um, Hezbollah carried out 3,100 um, attacks on Israel already. So we're already seeing an active war for wars on there. I think even minutes after the reports this morning of the attacks in Isfahan, Hezbollah already carried out an attack in northern Israel. So I do think, yes, we'll see escalation with the proxies. We'll see more attacks by the Houthis or Iraqi based militias. Um, we'll see more escalation in northern Israel. And that's, that's the way that that's the front that Iran prefers anyway. Iran would like that to be the front line because Iran likes to use others to fight its wars so that Iran ha doesn't have to do anything. Okay. Uh, Seth Fransman, good to see you this morning. Thanks very much indeed. OK, well, this is, of course, a developing situation. We will uh, keep you up to speed on all of the developments as they continue throughout the morning on breakfast. But for now, Ada McGiven has the weather. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome to the latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Rain clearing the southeast today, followed by further showers for many of us, accompanied by cool, blustery winds, although skies do brighten later in time for a sunny start to the weekend. Here's the picture by mid-morning, a lot of cloud on the map. Showers affecting many places, particularly central and eastern areas. Skies, though, do brighten across much of central and western Scotland, and then later on, western parts of the rest of the UK. We keep the showers going through the Midlands, the southeast as well, accompanied by a cool and gusty wind. That's going to make it feel a little disappointing, I think, with highs of 12 to 15 Celsius. Nevertheless, the showers across central areas do fade away into the evening. The skies tend to clear as well, and the wind eases. As a result, with lengthy clear skies, a lighter wind, Temperatures will fall through the night, touch of frost even as we begin Saturday. So gardeners beware, there will be some frostiness first thing. But there will be plenty of bright skies as well. Lots of sunshine lifting those temperatures fairly quickly through the morning. So if you're out and about first thing, 
it will soon warm up and there'll be plenty of sunshine until around the afternoon when the clouds will tend to build, particularly for central and northern parts of the country. And for the far north of Scotland, we're going to see some light outbreaks of rain move in here, making it feel cool elsewhere with lighter winds feeling pleasant enough. That warm feeling inside from Box Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. 6.22 and don't go anywhere because coming up in just a few minutes, Paul Coit will have all your latest sports news. I'm Michelle Jubery and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Saturday, 10 till 12, we'll bring you all of the news that you need to know. We'll also remind you that there is so much to smile about. It's my favourite time of the week. I get to relax, enjoy some lighthearted stories, and let Ellie teach me about fashion too. <laughs> That's Saturday Morning Live, every Saturday, 10 till 12. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. This is GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Six twenty-five. Good morning, Paul's here. Good morning. Morning. What have you got? We got a bit of European football. We do. You want the good news or the bad news? Uh, good. Should we do the good stuff? Yeah. Aston Villa are through to the semi-final of the Europa Conference League. Woo! Oh, brilliant. It went to penalties. Not like when Manchester City went out to penalties the other day. Mm. Uh, Aston Villa went through to penalties, so they played Lille, uh, which is en France, by the way. En I just France. thought I'd throw that in because yes. I am fluent in French. Um, Aston Villa were two-one up after the first leg, went to Lille, and Lille, they had obviously the crowd behind them, they went 2-0 up, Aston Villa score um, in the 87th minute to make it 2-1, it then goes to extra time, it then goes to penalties. Now, do you remember Emmy Martinez, Emiliano Martinez, who is the Argentinian goalkeeper, and there's a phrase which I can't use, which is, huh, housery. He's, uh, oh, yes, yes. How, oh, yes. Which yes. means there's a lot of messing around, a lot of yeah. antics. Yeah. So when he's in goal for penalties, it can work to their advantage because he tries to put off the other side. Yeah. You know, and there's and he'll push it right to the right to the edge. So he got a yellow card early on in the game. And then during the penalties, he's doing all this, all this stuff to the crowd, you know, all the shushing stuff. And yeah. So the referee comes over and books him for that, which is a second yellow, which is obviously means a red card. He'd be sent off. So the Aston Villa players, obviously that's the last person you want to lose during a penalty shootout as your goalkeeper. But this is something that so many football fans didn't realise when it comes to penalty shootout. Red cards don't count. Oh. So he was surprised to be, he probably thought he was going to get sent off as well, but he managed to go back in goal. Aston Villa went on penalties. Everybody's happy. Well, obviously, apart from well, everybody Lille. in Lille, <laughs> and Aston Villa are through. So right. good news right. uh, as far as Aston Villa's concerned. What's the bad news? The bad news is Liverpool could not overturn Atalanta. Atalanta were 3-0 up um, after the Anfield game, and uh, anyway, they go back to Italy. 
Liverpool score early with a penalty. Mo Salah, but again, still can't seem to finish all their chances. It was there, it was a possibility, but they won 1-0, so not good enough. So Jurgen Klopp, for his final season at Liverpool, will not be picking up a European trophy. I just think that he kind of sees the writing on the wall. Yeah. I don't think it's a matter of being tired. I think he thinks the team... Maybe this is the time for me to get out. So I think mm. this is what's going on. So they're out. West Ham played uh, Ellie's favourite team by Leverkusen. Mm -hmm. um, although I know you wanted West Ham to win, but the thing is, Leverkusen have not lost in 11 months. They're the Bundesliga champions. And West Ham went 1-0 up. And they just had to try and overturn a 2-0 deficit. Couldn't do it. Leverkusen scored at the end 1-1. So it means Leverkusen go through and West Ham are now out. Okay. So they're out. Should we look at the FA Cup? No more replays. Oh, yeah. Well, this is really upset the fans. Oh, it's upset fans. It's upset the lower league teams. I think most people are upset, apart from probably the FA and the Premier League, because the Premier League, they're they're the ones that have the cash. They're the ones that seem to have the say. They've put this press release out, going, "Oh, you know, this is wonderful news for the FA Cup. We've got a six-year deal. We're not going to have replays now. Replays, which is almost the, the great thing about the FA Cup, because when you get a lower league team, mm. they might get a draw, and then they get to go away to maybe Old Trafford or go to Anfield. Should Liverpool draw with them, and then that's where they make their money. But they've now banned." Any replay, so Why all games they, are going to be won. Why would they do that? It's because of the calendar congestion. The Premier League are really? just upset that there's too many games being played. It gets in the way. And also, they're going to move the FA Cup now. Instead of being... What, what you get, what's the opposite of a curtain raiser? What would it be a closer? What would be the uh, end of it? Uh, the, 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 the end? Well, it's usually the last game of the season. They're now going to move the FA Cup final to the penultimate game. Oh. So now the Premier League, because the Premier League thinking, ah, oh, you know, we're the golden goose, we're what everybody wants to see, the end of the Premier League is more important than the FA Cup. And it just devalues the FA Cup and a lot of people are very unhappy about it. Mm. Yeah. Including me. Yeah. Well, I'm not surprised, Yeah, actually. I like it, you know? It's, you know, a lot of us think, oh, we is it just because change. we're hard? Yeah, because we're going back to the golden days and how it used to be. There's some of that. But also, the FA Cup is the oldest cup competition in the world and it needs to be respected properly. Yeah. And unfortunately... I I don't think it is. Yeah. Mm. Uh, she talk about Emma Raducanu. She's oh, doing. She's doing really well. She's yeah. on the up, isn't she? She really is. Fourth game on the trot now. So she's doing so well. Um, so the Billie Jean Cup, she won two. There she is. I don't know what she's doing, waving the, the, the. And she's playing on clay, playing at the Stuttgart Open. The Czech Linda Noskova, who is the new golden child of tennis, and she's supposed to be fantastic. She is the future. But there we are. There's Emma Raducanu, beat her, 6-love, 7-5. Where do you reckon Emma Raducanu is in the world? Where would you reckon her ranking is? Oh, she's like 300 and something, isn't she? 301. Ah! You. Oh, you're very good. There you go. He's very good, isn't he? He is very good. Very he knows good. his stuff. Whereas she's through, now she plays Igor Sviantek. And where's Igor Sviantek in the world? 72. Number. One. Oh. That's who she's playing. <laughs> so this oh, is yeah. now going to be... It, 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 it's it my fault. I should have let you have the, uh, yeah. had the win and be done with it. But Igor Sviantek, she's playing uh, Emma Raducanu, and that's 4 o'clock this afternoon, and if Emma can get something from there, then something could be happening with Emma. So we wish her well against Igor Sviantek. Brilliant. Oh, that, let's have a bit of fashion. We didn't have time for it all We yesterday. didn't have time for it, yes. So there was no way that I was going to miss out on the fashion. No. Because no way. as sports pastimes and fashion correspondent... Uh -huh. Olympic opening ceremony... Outfits. Outfits and garb. Let's start with Brazil, shall we? Uh, Let's have a look at the Brazilians. Oh, I reckon this is good. Look oh, at that. No. Oh, it's all denim. It no, was, no, it's, no. It's a little flashing there for those that are concerned about the flashing images. There we are. Well, what do you think? It's a bit scruffy. It's like shaking Stevens. It does look out Yeah, there. it looks a bit scruffy. What's the denim? It's, it's denim yeah. jackets with embroidered images of Brazilian animals. Oh, no, it's like those awful things you used to see in the 80s. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I don't know whether they're going to double denim. I even mean, that the would text, be a crime, surely. Even the text choice of Brazil just isn't very nice. No, so. not liking that at all. No, we're not loving it. We don't like it. But the thing is, I don't even know, to be honest with you, what are Brazilian animals? What is the indigenous animal of Brazil? I don't even know what that is. A uh, parrot. 
I was going to say a parrot's toucan, something like yeah, that. Oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah, because of Rio. This, yeah, 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 yeah. So maybe they're just all covered in birds. I don't, oh, know. I don't know. But anyway, it's I was it's expecting denim. kind of feathers and carnival. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a letdown, isn't it? It is, yeah. it is a bit of a letdown. Let's go for Australia, shall we? So oh, Australia, yeah. See what the Australians are doing? Look well, at those. Classic, oh. They're not messing around. They're looking very serious. Old hand in the pocket. Very nice. Single breasted blazer over a cotton t shirt, gold and green ribbing. Uh, but, which is what we'll be doing if Australia win, by the way, gold and green ribbing. Beige, chino, knee-length shorts. Women with a double-breasted version of the jacket with a choice of shorts or just, which is just above the knee, a pleated skirt, gradient of green, gold and white. Uh, see, yeah. I like that. I like that. I think it's, very, isn't it? it's very Aussie. It is. Well, it's, it's pretty plain, though, don't you think? It is. Well, it is quite plain, but it's got a classy element to yeah, it. I'd rather, have, I'd rather have classy than, like, the Americans with their sweaters and all that yeah, sort of Yeah, yeah, and all that sort of business. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you, the Australian, you could have worn back in the 30s. You could wear it today, very classic. One more. Oh, God. Should we go for Canada? All right. Lululemon. Oh, oh, I bet yes. you love a bit of Lululemon, oh, don't you, Ellie? It's extortionate. Do you know how much a pair of leggings is? What? Well, like 70, 80 quid. What are they wearing? For a pair of leggings. What uh, are they well, wearing? This is, this well, that's typical. Good. That's typical. I mean, it's awful. That's awful. It I is mean, a that's bit of a mess, far. Is it tie dye? I don't even know what it. Well, Lululemon are, are emphasizing, obviously, okay. the adaptability, thermal comfort, oh, fit like function, and national pride of Canada. Look, there's even the dog oh, there. The is even wearing cute. Lululemon. Everybody's coming through there. I don't know how that shows national pride in Canada. It's well, just, it's just looks... red. It's, uh, just... it's red, yeah, that's about it. Uh, I think it's red tie dye. I mean, that's a bit neater now. So that's a full red. I think they look set. Quite frankly, oh, oh. I think it looks a bit scruffy. Yeah, I think not it looks... opening ceremony material. If it's National Pride, what do you just have a maple leaf on the front and just have red? It's Lululemon, I think. They probably charged a fortune and let them down very bad. Yeah, yeah, I think not so. impressed. That no. looks like a really comfy outfit you'd wear on a plane. Exactly. Not, not for what you'd wear to the opening ceremony. ceremony. What, exactly. have, we seen, have we got hours yet? Well, we've got the we've got the kit that they're going to be uh, competing Damn. in. So I can show you that a little bit later, yeah, but, but we, we don't, don't have the opening ceremony. Do you know Ooh. who's doing it? Who's going to hold the flag? No, which designer? Oh, I don't know. I imagine Adidas. I imagine because they have the, uh, they have the. Oh, we should have a British designer like um, Burberry well, or. Well, it was Stella McCartney. It was Stella McCartney, wasn't it, yeah. for 2012? Oh. But if you remember, she had the blue version of the Union Jack, and we know what happens if you mess around with an English flag. Yeah. You can't be doing that again. Yeah. So we'll have to see. So I think there's two things they're worried about. Firstly, how the, the public will react, and secondly, probably most importantly, is my commentary over how yeah. it will look fashion-wise. Oh. If they've done it and they've, they've played about with the, with the Union Jack, yeah. Already. Mm. Can you imagine? I there'll be, a, the there'll be a quick redesign going on, won't there? Already, people are saying about the about the British one, about what they'll be wearing to compete in. It's a little plain. It's a little plain. It's, it's very blue, not red. See, I like there was the old classic, the white vest with the red and blue stripe across the right. back. But um, I'll have it for you a little bit later. Lovely. By the way, London Marathon is this weekend. Uh, Hugh Brasher, who is the race director, he's the man that runs the whole thing, will be with us in an hour. Oh, stop. great. Okay. Thank great stuff, Paul. Thank you. Now, do stay with us. Still to come, we'll be looking at what is making the front pages this morning with Ella Whelan and Mike Buckley. That's next. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. Now, buses replace trains again today between Kilmarnock and Stranraer after a fire near the railway earlier. The M6 in Warwickshire is partly blocked southbound by an accident between junctions 3 and 2 from Coventry to the M69, causing queues. In Northamptonshire, there's a report of an accident on the A43 on the roundabout off junction 8 of the A14 north of Kettering. In London, the A123 is closed each way along Cranbrook Road in Ilford off Beehive Lane after an accident. Nine bus routes are having to divert as a result. And on the A48M in Cardiff, the outside lane remains closed southbound for emergency barrier repairs after an accident earlier this week at the Eastern Avenue junction at St Melons. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. 
Join me, Neil Oliver, every Sunday night at 6pm on GB News. And if an hour is not nearly enough for you, go to gbnews.com for special extended episodes online every Friday at 9pm, where we can truly get into the nitty gritty of what's going on. GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Saturday, 10 till 12, we'll bring you all of the news that you need to know. We'll also remind you that there is so much to smile about. It's my favourite time of the week. I get to relax, enjoy some lighthearted stories and let Ellie teach me about fashion too. <laughs> That's Saturday Morning Live, every Saturday, 10 till 12. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Six thirty-seven. Morning to you. Let's have a, a look at the newspapers. <laughs> if I get my teeth in this morning, the Telegraph says the Prime Minister has vowed to end sick note culture. The Guardian says that Thames Water could be renationalised and the fifteen billion pounds it owes could be added to the public debt. Oh, great. Uh, the Times leads with the Prime Minister vowing to crack down on sick note culture. Uh, MPs losing the right to sign us off work. Mm. The Express says that the Prime Minister tells Sick Note Britain to get a grip and get a job. The Mail leads with the charge brought against Nicola Sturgeon's husband, Peter Morrell. Well, joining us now to go through what's making the news this morning is former, former Labour advisor Mike Buckley and journalist and author Ella Whelan. Good to see you both this morning. Mm. Um, and Ella, let's start with you, shall we, and uh, your response to what we've seen in Iran this morning, that strike by Israel. Yes, um, the papers obviously weren't, uh, aren't in time to cover it, but mm. we've seen those intercepted um, strikes. And it's actually quite interesting how much Iran is downplaying this. Mm. Um, there's, and you've got um, BBC and various other news outlets reporting that there isn't, doesn't seem to be much damage, um, that actually there's a sort of almost everything is fine attitude being um, put out there. The airports have reopened. Um, and we obviously await Iran's response. Um, who knows what it could be? The Telegraph is reporting on its front pages. This is obviously before the action that Israel took happened, um, that Iran had threatened to open, reopen the sort of nuclear discussion, build a nuclear bomb if it is attacked by Israeli forces. Lots of heavy talk there. But again, we don't know what the actual response is going to be. Um, I mean, you know, this is, a, this is a sort of shadow war that's broken out into the open in terms of direct strikes between the two nations. Mm. But it is still... Um, I mean, the, all of the, we know that all of the drone strikes that Iran sent were intercepted by Israel and also America and France and, um, and us, by us, the UK and Jordan. So there's this sort of, I, I, I don't mean to sound callous, but people aren't dying in their masses. Mm. So it's a different kind of tenor to it. There's a different sort of um, es escalation feel to it, which I think we should, we, we should keep in mind. This isn't sort of direct outright war in which people are dying, there's still an element of kind of shadow boxing to this, which doesn't mean it's not serious, but it means that it's not, we're not necessarily in a situation now where Iran is going to have a nuclear response. Viewers and mm. listeners shouldn't be worried about that. No, I mean, I, the interesting thing, Mike, with all of this is if, if we were going to get the, um, the, the massive and immediate response from Iran that they were threatening only just the other day, you would have expected the rhetoric from Iran coming out now to be very different to what it seems to be. You would. Uh, and Iran, I mean, obviously, there's many, many criticisms we could all make of Iran, and many people do make those criticisms, and understandably. But it does seem to be that in this situation, they are aware that they have a responsibility to act in a way that is, you know, almost responsible, you know, not turning this into a, a conflagration that would cause huge loss of life or huge damage to, to infrastructure in Israel or in Iran or would potentially open up a, a region-wide conflict. Uh, in contrast, of course, you know, Israel, in a sense, did start this with, with, in Iran by attacking their diplomatic building in Syria. And just reading this morning, obviously, Israel have now responded <clears throat> um, by sort of re-attacking Iran, and they've also attacked sites again in Syria and Iraq. So, you know, Israel does seem to be rather, you know, going, going much further in terms of just almost arbitrarily attacking uh, sites in, in any, any country in the region that it well, feels like well, it wants that's, to. <clears throat> that's not accurate. If, um, I mean, that's completely forgetting the 7th of October. Which I'm not was... forgetting about that in the no, slightest. But, I'm no, just saying on, it, that they are with impunity it, attacking it, sites in any country in the region it, where they feel it, like impunity? it. Impunity? You're, you're completely forgetting that... 
Um, the reason why there is a... You don't have to be, a, a, you know, Israel's biggest fan to understand that, this, that they didn't start this with the attack in I, I Damascus. I don't completely that, understand. That's what However, you just said. However, they are still attacking sites in lots of countries in the region. That, that's, that's what you just said. I mean, <clears throat> this is a war that has been... You know, Iran has been attacking Israel through its pra proxies for decades now. I mean, the reason why Israel has this Iron Dome and, um, you know, huge security infrastructure is because of the attacks on it. And we know that this conflict is complicated. But I think you do a disservice to understanding what's going on in the Middle East by suggesting that Israel started this. It's much more complicated than that. It's that Damascus certainly wasn't the first attack, first, uh, you know, between the two countries. I, you're, used to, you're, I mean, for context, I used to live and work in the Middle East, so I do understand the context pretty well, and I do understand why Israel well, feels but you don't, going you the way that it, wrong. it does. But I also understand that the countries in the region, you know, have their own needs and rights for security as well. So it, it is a complicated situation. But the point I was making was that Iran has not responded in, you know, in a huge way to its, the, the attack on its building in Syria or to the attack that uh, has now come from Israel. You know, it is downplaying it. Whereas Israel is sitting there and attacking countries arbitrarily, not arbitrarily, right. but you know, it is it is going further in making those attacks. Okay, look, we need to leave you two on that note uh, just for a moment because we want to uh, talk to the Work and Pension Secretary, Mel Stride, who joins us now. And first and foremost, Mr. Stride, can I get your reaction to to what we've seen happen in the last hour or so? How concerned should we be, or do you think? that the responses here have been a little bit measured? Well, this is clearly uh, an emerging story, so we don't know the full facts at this stage, and Israel has yet to uh, confirm action or otherwise. Look, I'd make a few points here. I think one is that we firmly believe that Israel has a right uh, to self-defence. But at the same time, of course, what we have been impressing upon the Israeli government is the importance of de-escalation at this point. So whilst we don't know the details at the moment, uh, my hope is that whatever has happened is of a nature uh, where de-escalation can now be the way forward. And of course, we can continue then uh, to focus on the diplomatic work that we and others are doing to ensure that we get humanitarian aid into Gaza um, and we've already um, applied uh, uh, some or been in discussions with the Israeli, Israelis to have uh, the uh, uh, FES uh, um, uh, border uh, opened up to let aid in and Ashdod as a port to let aid in and uh, so on and also to get the hostages out. That's where uh, we are also focusing. Did the UK government have advance warning of this strike by Israel in the early hours of this morning and does the UK government endorse the response by Israel, because you must be very concerned about escalation in the region. Well, as I've just said, I'm clearly the message that uh, we and our allies and the Americans as well uh, have uh, for Israel is, yes, you have a right to self-defence, of course, and we are uh, here to support you in that endeavour. Um, but at the same time, we do feel it's very important that the focus now is on de-escalation. I can't comment on the specifics of whether we had warnings uh, or not, or indeed, even at this stage, of course, this is an unconfirmed uh, situation, so we don't actually know precisely, and I certainly don't know uh, what has happened. But de-escalation really has to be uh, the way forward, and, and that is uh, this government's message. OK, uh, look, can we ask you about this sick note Britain thing? It's across a lot of the papers this morning. Mm. The Prime Minister going to war on sick note Britain, and part of the, part of the, the move to, to do this, he says, is to is to stop GPs giving out sick notes or fit notes or whatever they're called these days. How's that going to work? Well, the, the situation at the moment is that we have a growing number of people going on to long-term sickness benefits. There are 2.8 million people on those benefits at the moment. We know that a reasonable proportion of those people, for example, want to work. And what I'm all about is making sure that in that journey that sometimes people are taking from work through a fit note, uh, then into longer term sickness benefits, that at each stage of that journey, we do whatever we can to support people into work. Now, with fit notes, what that means is that when somebody presents themselves to the doctor seeking a fit note at the moment, 
They get, on average, about seven minutes of the GP's time because GPs are very, very pressurised and have an, an awful lot to do. And on 94% of occasions, a box is ticked on the thick note that says not capable of any work whatsoever. So what we want to do is to move from that situation to a referral by the GP to uh, another uh, piece of uh, an organisation that we're putting together based around something called WorkWell, where we will bring together both the healthcare support that that individual uh, needs, but also have work coaches involved so that if they're currently in work, we're working to keep them in work. And if they're close to the labour market, we're there to find them a job because we believe that work is absolutely essential, not least when it comes to uh, mental health conditions and people improving uh, their situation. Mental health charities, though, are aghast at these plans. The chief executive of the charity Mind says they're deeply disappointed, continuing a trend in recent rhetoric that conjures up the image that mental health culture has gone too far. They say it's harmful, inaccurate and contrary to the reality of people up and down the country, demonising people for failures of the system. What do you say to that? Well, I completely and utterly disagree uh, with that. Look, uh, it, it's a very good thing that as a society we have moved to the point where we can talk very openly about mental health uh, as an issue. And there are many, many people as a consequence of that who are now coming forward and receiving treatment who in the past would have suffered in silence. And that's a huge step forward. At the same time, I think we have to recognise that, it, that work, for example, which is what my department is focused on, is an integral part for many people when it comes to mental health, an integral part of recovery. And I think that message has begun to get lost and we need to bring that back to the fore. And to give you an example, there's much um, evidence that this is the case. Work gives you that structure uh, to your life. It brings you into contact with colleagues at work, those conversations at the water cooler, all those kind of interactions and that sense of purpose. It's really good for you and we mustn't lose sight of that. And what the Prime Minister later on this morning is going to be uh, speaking about is how we can go still further than we are at the moment to make sure that work is central to addressing these particular issues. But, it, but there'll be plenty of people watching and listening now, Minister, who who, frankly, are going to say, well, if, if, if I require a significant of t amount of time off because I'm not well, I want to be able to go and see my GP and get signed off. They're not going to want to go and see the GP, be referred, wait for that, and then go and see a work coach. You can't imagine this going down well with people at all in the run-up to an election. This needs, this, this, this needs to be a very efficient process, so work well will bring together the medical practitioner with the work uh, support as well in a one-stop shop. So uh, the aim here will be something that will be very efficient and very quick, but will nonetheless put work at the heart of the kind of support that we're able to give people. It, it's not helpful to people if they're in work at the moment. We know 400,000 people leave work for reasons of ill health uh, each year. It's not helpful if they leave work lose that contact with employment and then progress along this health journey, end up as part of that 2.8 million people who are in long-term sickness and disability uh, benefits and a long way from the labour market. We believe we should be intervening upstream early to get that kind of support in there. And the kind of support includes things like talking therapies within the NHS. The Chancellor announced 400,000 more of those that will be of huge benefit to those with mental health conditions. We've launched something called universal support, which means we place people into employment and we stay with them for a period of 12 months to support them through to make sure that they hold down uh, those jobs. But as I say, this is really sharpening up the focus on the importance of work rather than being on benefits. Mr Stride, I wanted to ask you about Thames Water because Guardian, the Guardian this morning, uh, revealing government plans being considered at the moment for Thames Water to be renationalised and the, for the £15.6 billion it owes to be added to the public debt. I mean, that's not going to go down well in an election year either, is it? Well, I, my understanding is this is a story in The Guardian and I, I think it is speculation. This isn't something that the government has said. Um, I think it'd be rather surprising if the government wasn't um, uh, gaming all sorts of possible scenarios here as to what 
it might do under in certain eventualities. But at the moment, Thames Water clearly is looking at uh, refinancing and uh, in discussions with various people uh, on that front. But I think the sort of guarantee that I can absolutely make today is that whatever uh, happens uh, going forward, uh, people will be able to get their water out of their taps in the usual uh, way. But the story that uh, you've just referred to um, is not something that the government is saying. I think it's uh, speculation in the press. OK, well, just, just so you know, the, the, the Guardian newspaper has said that this blueprint is, is codenamed Project Timber. They say it's at an advanced stage. Uh, so just, yeah. just to... <laughs> just yeah. so you know. Just so you know, um, that's what they're, they're saying this morning. OK, Minister, good to see you this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Ella Whelan and Mike Buckley still with us. Um, on Sick Note Britain, we should, we should call it Fit Note Britain. Mm. It's beyond me why they're called <clears> Fit Notes. <throat> Uh, what, what did you make of the plan, Ella? Uh, well, just in terms of the sort of... We, it's impossible to get anything done on the NHS. Even getting a GP appointment is enough of a challenge for most people. So the idea that if you are sick and you need time off, as you said, trying to go through this process, which would take, I think, at best, you know, weeks, is, is ridiculous. But it's also the case that, I mean, Mel Stride is and the government are putting out this line that people really want to be at work um, and it's just that they can't... There's, some, there's something going wrong that they can't get to work and so we're just trying to help them along. That's a complete misunderstanding. There's a lot of people out there who either, you know, really do have either physical or mental problems and it's impossible to get treatment on the NHS at the moment so they need sick notes. Or... You know, I think there's this idea that Malstrad and other people think that everybody has a, treats jobs like a career that they love and it's great and you've got loads of friends and it's sunny and lovely. In actual fact, a lot, vast numbers of people out there go to work to earn money for their families. Yeah, and it's they just hate a, it. They hate it and it's a trap. Or, you know, it's something yeah. you bear to make money for the important things in your life. Mm. And if you're faced with uh, the prospect of... At the moment, we have a lot of really rubbish jobs paid very badly. Between that and, you know, a different option, I, I don't blame people for taking the other option. And I think there's this misunderstanding that work-life is this wonderful... Panacea. Yeah, thing, yeah. and that's not the reality. Mm. Mike? Uh, I mean, the government's lying to us all. You know, it's sitting there saying, no, you know, fit note culture is out of control. In fact, we, we did issue 11 million fit notes last year, but that's the same as before the pandemic. So it's not that the numbers of fit notes being issued are, you know, off the scale. What has grown a lot is people long-term sick, which is a different thing entirely. And that is in large part due to the fact that the NHS just, just doesn't work, you know, which we know whether it's A&E or whether it's trying to get a GP, GP appointment, whether it's trying to get treatment for long-term conditions. There has also been a rise in mental health conditions across the country, partly as a result of the pandemic, which we seem to be unable to deal with. We've got 1.9 million people in this country waiting to get a mental health appointment on the NHS because there just isn't the provision there. So unless we're solving these fundamental problems... This is this situation isn't going to change. The government seems to want to come in and say well, maybe it will, these well, people are not well, well. Let's just pretend that they're not well. well no, it's like they're trying to pretend that Rwanda is a safe country when it isn't. No, you know? no, hold on a minute. Though, it, it, I mean, in some respects, I would have thought you'd be you'd be supporting this initiative then, because if they're saying, well, you know, if you're struggling with mental health, you get assessed by a medical professional, you get to see a work coach to you know build your resilience, see what you're going. to be good at going back to what you're going to be capable of doing, isn't, wouldn't that be a positive If that support is real, then yes, I would support it. But they haven't spoken about recruiting any of these professionals to actually do this work and support people. I mean, if that was real, then that would be great. But at the minute, as I'm saying, we've got 1.9 million people waiting to get some treatment on the NHS for their mental health conditions, and that provision just isn't there. So I'm not sure where they're getting all this extra mental health support and staff from. If they have, then great, but they didn't talk about that this morning. No. Well, we shall wait and see. I'd love to know what you think about that. gbviews.com slash your say. It'd be great to hear what you think about that and everything else that we're talking about this morning. It's, um, at least, are we, are we breathing a little bit of, of a sigh of relief in a, in a sense that what we thought could have been catastrophic today may not be? In and terms of in Iran? In terms of Iran. I, I, you look, I think so. I think also it's important to note that... I, uh, you know, the response from the Iran attack, international response, UK, Jordan, you know, people within the region, countries within the region, aren't necessarily cheering Iran on. No, well, that's uh. good. All right, we're out of time. Uh, here's the weather. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Hello and welcome to the latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Rain clearing the southeast today, followed by further showers for many of us, accompanied by cool, blustery winds, although skies do brighten later in time for a sunny start to the weekend. Here's the picture by mid-morning, a lot of cloud on the map. Showers affecting many places, particularly central and eastern areas. Skies, though, do brighten across much of central and western Scotland, and then later on, western parts of the rest of the UK. We keep the showers going through the Midlands, the southeast as well, accompanied by a cool and gusty wind. That's going to make it feel a little disappointing, I think, with highs of 12 to 15 Celsius. Nevertheless, the showers across central areas do fade away into the evening. The skies tend to clear as well, and the wind eases. As a result, with lengthy clear skies, a lighter wind, Temperatures will fall through the night, touch a frost even as we begin Saturday. So gardeners beware, there will be some frostiness first thing. But there will be plenty of bright skies as well. Lots of sunshine lifting those temperatures fairly quickly through the morning. So if you're out and about first thing, it will soon warm up. And there'll be plenty of sunshine until around the afternoon when the clouds will tend to build, particularly for central and northern parts of the country. And for the far north of Scotland, we're going to see some light outbreaks of rain move in here, making it feel cool. Elsewhere, with lighter winds, feeling pleasant enough. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. Now, buses replaced trains again today between Kilmarnock and Stranraer after a fire near the railway earlier. It's also a half-hourly shuttle train service operating between Eyre and Prestwick Town. Now, on the A48M in Cardiff, the outside lane remains closed southbound at the Eastern Avenue Junction at St Melons for emergency barrier repairs damage caused by an accident earlier this week. In London, the A123 Cranbrook Road in Ilford is closed each way off Beehive Lane after an accident. Nine bus routes are diverting as a result. And in Kent, it's slow on the A249, heading south towards Junction 5 of the M2. The stop will be roundabout at Sittingbourne, and that's because of roadworks. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. Gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Good morning to you. It's 7 o'clock, Friday the 19th of April. Today, the world holding its breath as US sources claim Israel has launched an attack on Iran in a retaliatory strike with reports of explosions near a military base in Isfahan. The Work and Pension Secretary spoke to us earlier here on GB News. We believe that Israel has a right uh, to self-defence. But at the same time, of course, what we have been impressing upon the Israeli government is the importance of de-escalation at this point. Iranian state media downplay the attack as the news agency claims the country's nuclear facilities are completely secure. As a senior commander tells them, no damage was done. Well, that's as Tehran had previously warned of a severe and immediate response to any Israeli attack as the country activates its air defence systems. Meanwhile, Western governments tell its citizens to leave Israel over fears of a reprisal attack by Iran. Here, the Prime Minister pledges to end the sick note culture in Britain. We've heard this morning from the Work and Pension Secretary, who says it's the right way forward to get people back to work. 
And in the sport, Emmy Martinez's antics in goal. We'll see Aston Villa, or has done, see them go through on a penalty shootout to the Europa Conference League semi final as Liverpool and West Ham go out of the Europa League. Emma Raducanu's playing great injury free tennis. How about that? And the London Marathons this Sunday, the man who organises it will be with us a little bit later. It's going to be a sunny start to the weekend for many of us as higher pressure finally arrives. But before we get there, Today is another day of bright spells and showers. I'll have the full details in the forecast coming up shortly. Morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello, and this is Breakfast on GB News. Well, the breaking news this morning is that Israel has reportedly launched an attack on Iran overnight in a retaliatory strike. Reports of explosions near a military base in Isfahan. Now, that's according to U.S. officials. Well, Iranian state media have been quick to downplay the situation, claiming that their air defence systems were able to destroy three drones in the centre of the country. Uh, well, Israeli officials uh, yet to make a clear statement on the attack, but Iranian state media claim it was flown, or the, the drones at least, were flown by infiltrators from inside the country. So that, frankly, adds a bit of confusion to the situation. And it may be something that they're saying to, to mean that they don't have to then justify... They don't have to have yeah. a response. So this is where it, it does get a little bit complicated. Well, meanwhile, the Australian government has urged its citizens to leave Israel over fears of a potential revenge attack. Let's get the latest now from our security editor, Mark White. Morning to you, Mark. So, so where are we at the moment? What do we understand has happened? Well, a limited strike, uh, it appears, has taken place. We have these reports coming from Iranian state media. It's not exactly uh, open in terms of uh, the media, free and open reporting there. So we're reliant to a large degree on what the Iranian state media is saying. Uh, they're talking about these drones, three drones that were shot down. It's possible that Israel has launched drones at Iran, but I think unlikely. It's an awful long way for drones to fly to Iran. They're slow-moving targets and easy to shoot down. I think Israel much more likely to have launched missiles. Uh, intriguing this report, though, so, uh, again from uh, Iranian media reporting that the drones may have been launched uh, from groups within Iran. We know, of course, there are uh, opposition groups uh, and opposition groups that... Uh, are fighting, to some extent, uh, a war against the Iranian regime. So it's possible that they have been given drones, ha managed to acquire drone drones somehow and have launched them from in-country. That will only really emerge in the fullness of time, uh, depending, again, on, on you know what we're hearing from uh, state media to a large de degree as well. Um, but the, the strikes that we know about took place around the central Iranian city of Isfahan. Um, and we're told that um, an airbase is in that area, uh, but no reports of damage at this airbase. There's also a radar, a military radar installation there. There's also uh, one of the key sites for Iran's nuclear facilities, research facility, and also a nuclear enrichment facility. But again... No indication that that's been struck. In fact, the International Atomic Energy Authority has confirmed that no uh, damage or strikes appear to have targeted the nuclear facilities in Isfahan. Um, so we await to get a formal word from Israel. They've said nothing so far. Uh, indeed, the US has said nothing officially, just sources uh, telling US uh, broadcasts and media outlets that Israel did inform them that they were about to uh, launch uh, an attack on Iran. Uh, they gave nothing more about what Israel said the nature of that attack would be, uh, how limited or otherwise it would be, whether this is the first phase. We simply don't know. But Iran is playing it down. The state media 
confirming that the aviation sector in Iran is opening back up again. Now, that's different from what we were hearing just hours ago from Iranian officials who were warning that if Israel launched a direct attack on Iran, then they would respond immediately with a massive attack on Israel. That's not happened, obviously. This was some hours ago that this attack took place within Iran and no response as yet. Hopefully that's a good sign. But as I say, it all depends really on what Israel's next move might be. And of course, just because we've not had an immediate response doesn't mean we're not going to get some kind of response from Iran in the coming hours, perhaps through its proxies, perhaps in other areas, not necessarily a direct attack on Israel. Okay. Mark White, thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, let's talk to diplomatic correspondent for Israel Khan TV, Amakai Stein, who joins us now. Great to see you this morning, Amakai. Um, are we getting any official comment from the Israeli government at this stage? No. There was complete quiet from the Israeli government, although we saw in the last week Israeli officials saying that there will be a response, that it's not questions of if, but when. You do see, by the way, um, Israeli Minister Itamar ben -Vir, who is a member of Israel's security cabinet, tweeting that what we saw tonight is really not a response. Now, I must say, uh, it's like an official Israeli confirmation that there was a strike, but Itamar ben -Gvir is not one of these officials that, if indeed it was an Israeli airstrike, he uh, had the decision made. So there is criticism among um, some ministers inside the government that an Israeli response should have been much more aggressive and much more um, comprehensive against Iran on their attack uh, on Israel a few days ago. But up until now, if you ask what the prime minister is saying, what the Israeli defense minister is saying, from their side, there is complete quiet this morning. There is no a statement saying Israel did attack Iran at some point tonight. Amakai, what should we read anything into that, into the silence from Israel so far? Is this an indication that this isn't over yet, that this could just be phase one of this operation? I don't know if there will be other phases. We do know that Israeli officials are speaking uh, with foreign media, the New York Times, Washington Post, and there they're saying that this strike was a message that we can strike Iran inside the territory. And it's not the first time that Israel has struck Iran, according to foreign reports, but it's the first time that Iran is expecting some kind of an Israeli response. So Israel can show in this strike that even though Iran knew something is coming, Israel could have pinpointed this airbase and struck inside a military airbase when you where you can expect fighter jets and um, defense system against these kinds of, of attack styles. So Israel in this attack shows Iran we can attack you inside Iran even though you are expecting it. And yet we're getting these comments from um, Iran itself saying, well, perhaps this was carried out by infiltrators, an internal attack. I mean, it's very difficult to know quite why they're saying that. Is that is, would that give them a, a reason to not respond to this in the way that they previously threatened? Yes, of course. Iran is saying that there was nothing tonight except three uh, quadruple drones that were uh, struck by Iranian uh, defense system. That, that, that's what happened. You know, they're, they're, we are seeing, for example, this morning, the announcement that the airspace over airports have been reopened and things like that. So Iran is trying to show that from their side, nothing really happened tonight. And if nothing happened, they don't need to respond. Uh, that's the story right now. But already during the night between Saturday and Sunday, we saw Iranian officials saying that their strike is, is the end of the story, meaning they want to close the story. And I think also Israel went on, on a, a very thick line, uh, trying on the one hand to respond inside Iran, to show that Israel is responding to these attacks inside the territory of Iran. 
But on the other hand, try to show the world that the response is not a response that will trigger an escalation in the region. That was the request of the Americans. That was the request of the UK foreign minister who was in Israel this week. So, so I think Israel went on this fake line, did respond in Iran, but it's not something or it's not a response we haven't seen before. Mm. I mean, we're talking about Iranian rhetoric, and they're obviously trying to, to play it down this morning, suggesting that perhaps they don't want uh, to make any uh, response at all. But is there a possibility that we could see a reaction in terms of their proxies in the region, that they could ramp up offences by Hezbollah, by, um, by the Houthis, all of those operating in the region? I must say, first of all, um, in recent weeks or months even, we don't need a specific reason for the proxies to increase their attacks on Israel. You don't need a reason, or Iran doesn't need to show that it has been hurt, so they will increase the response. So uh, I think in this front, um, we might see something from the Iranian proxies much more increased. But again, their response is usually is not connected to things happening in Iran, especially if Iran is saying that nothing happened, they sometimes increase their attacks, sometimes they don't. But I think it's less related, or at least it won't be publicly related to what we saw tonight in Iran. OK. And Mikhail Stein, really appreciate your time this morning. Thanks very much indeed. Well, joining us now is former senior military intelligence officer Philip Ingram. Good to see you this morning, Philip. Good What's morning. your assessment of what we saw in the early hours of this morning? Well, it, it's really simple. We don't have enough information to know exactly what happened. You know, something happened. Iran closed its airspace. You know, uh, you know, unnamed U.S. officials spoke to uh, U.S. press outlets saying that there, ha there had been an attack. And then we get lots of stuff circulating on social media. Um, some of the videos I've seen circulating on social media, uh, there are other circulations saying they were shown yesterday or the day before um, uh, suggesting attacks in southern Lebanon. So we're in an era of um, misinformation and disinformation as people try to speculate what could and could not have happened. Something happened and we don't know what it is. It's interesting, though, isn't it, that amidst all of this, because even with speculation, that can be used as an excuse by some states to provoke action. It is interesting that, that I mean, Israel is saying nothing. Iran is, is playing it down significantly as well. I mean, they're, they're saying something's happened, but they are playing it down. Yeah, uh, of, of course. You know, and you'll find that you know, in Iran, it's, they're still taking time to gather the uh, information together into you know, their central um, communications organizations before they put statements out to know exactly what's happened. Um, you know, even if uh, something happens you know, in the UK with the interconnectivity that we've got, it takes time for that information to filter, for people to understand exactly what's happened, the implications of that, to look at it, to then get proper statements out of governments and all the rest of it. So that's not something that um, surprises me at all. Um, mm -hmm. Israel is going to keep quiet um, if it if it is carried out, you know, the, a, a significant attack. But you know, Israel has been saying for days that it, it it was going to respond. The extreme right wing element of the Israeli government was almost forcing Netanyahu to respond. Um, and you know, if they if Israel um, told the United States last night that they were going to attack, that is something that I'd expect because it it allows airspace de deconfliction to go on, um, so that um, the U.S. and Allied aircraft, including UK aircraft that are flying over Syria are not necessarily surprised by um, uh, uh, objects, whether they be fixed-wing aircraft or drones flying from Israel, or uh, pick up unusual activity on radar um, that's happening inside Iran itself. So that pre-warning is not something that uh, is set out to embarrass the United States, the United Kingdom and the international community. It's, it's just standard airspace deconfliction. And in terms of, of this strike, I mean, it is early. As you say, there's a lot of confusion. Uh, there's not a lot of clarity about what exactly happened in the early hours of this morning. But from what we know so far, this does look like a very careful, measured response by Israel. Well, you know, from, from what we're speculating so far, I don't think there's much that we know in, in what's going on. In, you know, if, if, if I was sitting in a military headquarters and this was going on around me, 
um, and I'm sitting in the intelligence cell trying to work out what's happening. Um, I'd call it my soap time, and I've got one thing that I go and do when that happens, is I go and put the kettle on, make a cup of tea, and wait for more information to come in, because um, it, 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 it's too easy to over-speculate and, theref and therefore work out what's going on. There, something has happened. Uh, and that is almost certainly you know, some form of Israeli activity. That is Israel putting one foot up the next rung of the ladder of escalation. Um, it would be too easy to speculate that they then lift themselves up and put both feet on it. And if that happens, then there's always the potential, given Iran statements, for Iran to do exactly the same. And that's a very, very dangerous position. There's been a lot of diplomatic pressure put on Israel not to enable that to happen. And there'll be an awful lot of diplomatic pressure going on behind closed doors with Iran not to respond if Israel does something. So we're hearing lots of stuff on the surface. Underneath that, there's an awful lot of activity going on from a global perspective to try and stop this becoming something that escalates into a regional war. OK, Philip Ingram, good to see you, as always, and for talking some sense. Thank you mm. very much indeed. Well, of course, this is a developing situation. We will try and seek some clarity for you throughout the programme this morning and, of course, we'll bring that to you on breakfast. But for now, Aidan McGiven has the weather. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome to the latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Rain clearing the southeast today, followed by further showers for many of us, accompanied by cool, blustery winds, although skies do brighten later in time for a sunny start to the weekend. Here's the picture by mid-morning, a lot of cloud on the map. Showers affecting many places, particularly central and eastern areas. Skies, though, do brighten across much of central and western Scotland and then later on, western parts of the rest of the UK. We keep the showers going through the Midlands, the southeast as well, accompanied by a cool and gusty wind. That's going to make it feel a little disappointing, I think, with highs of 12 to 15 Celsius. Nevertheless, the showers across central areas do fade away into the evening. The skies tend to clear as well and the wind eases. As a result, with lengthy clear skies, a lighter wind, Temperatures will fall through the night, touch a frost even as we begin Saturday. So gardeners beware, there will be some frostiness first thing, but there'll be plenty of bright skies as well. Lots of sunshine lifting those temperatures fairly quickly through the morning. So if you're out and about first thing, it will soon warm up and there'll be plenty of sunshine until around the afternoon when the clouds will tend to build, particularly for central and northern parts of the country. And for the far north of Scotland, we're going to see some light outbreaks of rain move in here, making it feel cool elsewhere with lighter winds feeling pleasant enough. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Now, here's some good news for mm. you this morning. There is still time to grab your chance to win a Greek cruise, travel goodies and £10,000 tax-free cash bank balance boost. Yes, that's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, here's all the details that you need. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel Gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Yes, good luck indeed. Now, still to come, the government vows to crack down on sick note Britain. I'll tell you more next.
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my argument to... for no, me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. If you want your news to be straight talking, this is the nightmare for the Conservatives again. Down to earth. It's not just Nottingham where this is happening, is it? And most importantly, honest. Hard-working, middle-class taxpayers, they'll get their book thrown at them. Then catch me, Martin Daubney, Monday to Friday, 3 to 6 p.m. on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes and Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Now, the Prime Minister is set to unveil a package of welfare reform measures to tackle Britain's sick note culture, which is ironic because they're not even called sick notes anymore. Fit notes, aren't fit they? Fit notes. Mm. Why are they called fit notes? To say that you're not fit. Trust me, that. Anyway, the government's claims it has resulted in a significant rise in people being unnecessarily written off work and parked on welfare. Let's talk to our political correspondent, Catherine Forster. So what are they planning, Catherine? Yes, good morning, uh, Stephen and Ellie. Well, they want to reduce the cost fundamentally to all of us, the taxpayer, in uh, sickness and disability benefits because it is quite eye-watering at the moment, some £69 billion a year. That's more than the budget for schools or for police and it's currently projected to hit £90 billion, uh, by the end of the next parliament. So that is the reason why? And also, we've now got some 2.8 million people on long-term sickness benefits. So very, very expensive. The government is very keen to bring that number down. So what they are planning, we've heard from the Work and Pensions Secretary, uh, Mel Stride, this morning. The Prime Minister will be making a speech um, after nine o'clock, is um, potentially taking the ability uh, away from GPs to... Uh, give these fit notes, as they call them, out. Uh, they issued some 11 million last year. If, you know, you are, are, are struggling, you have uh, uh, sickness, illness, problems, go to the doctor, they sign you off work. Uh, the government point out that the GP has, on average, only seven or eight minutes to 
assess you. Um, the government are looking into uh, basically doing something rather different. So getting a health assessment and work assessment together and what Mel Stride calls a one-stop shop. And then rather than uh, signing you off work and sort of leaving you to languish on benefits, working out how they may either keep you in work or support you back into work. Uh, they're very keen to stress the benefits of work to people's mental health. Uh, of course, a lot of concerns from charities who feel that the government's messaging that perhaps uh, mental health, anxiety, depression, that perhaps it has been over uh, categorised or, 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 you know, given undue weight perhaps. So uh, let's see. I do think there will be considerable difficulties with this. It's just a consultation at the moment. But given the pressures within the NHS, uh, bringing together work specialist healthcare professionals, I think will be a challenge. But you can see the thinking uh, behind it. Another point is, of course, the, the huge waiting lists in the NHS for treatment. There's millions of people waiting to begin treatment. That, of course, is going to have a knock-on effect on the ability of people to work. So getting the waiting list down um, would benefit uh, the government's welfare bill. But as we've see seen, uh, they're not having a huge amount of luck with that at the moment. OK. Catherine Forster, good to see you this morning. Thank you very much indeed. All right, don't go anywhere. Paul's going to be back with all the sport and some interesting stuff on the marathon, which is mm. happening on Sunday. That's in a couple of minutes. The latest GB News travel. Good morning. In the Highland, the A862 is closed in both directions along Clacton Harry Road at Scorgui in Inverness because of a fire. Buses replaced trains again today between Kilmarnock and Stranra after a fire near the railway line earlier this week. The Half Valley shuttle train running between Eyre and Prestwick Town. On the A48M in Cardiff, the outside lane remains closed southbound at St Mellons for emergency repairs after an accident earlier this week. In London, the A123 Cranbrook Road in Ilford is closed off Beehive Lane after an accident. Nine bus routes are having to divert as a result and in Kent it's slow on the A249 heading south towards junction 5 of the M2 at the Stockbury roundabout in Sittingbourne. Those delays caused by ongoing roadworks. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Every Saturday, 10 till 12, we'll bring you all of the news that you need to know. We'll also remind you that there is so much to smile about. It's my favourite time of the week. I get to relax, enjoy some lighthearted stories and let Ellie teach me about fashion too. <laughs> That's Saturday Morning Live, every Saturday, 10 till 12. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Gloria DiPiero. This is GB News, Britain's election channel.
Right, should we go through the sport? Well, we should, yeah. Paul Coyce is here. Good morning. Good morning. A couple of things to go through. Firstly, yeah. football. We better cover that briefly. Uh, Aston Villa, good for them. They're through to the semi-finals of the Europa Conference League. It went to penalties. Emi Martinez, their Argentini, Argentinian... Argentini. Argen the, Argen the Argentini character... Emi Martinez, Emiliano. <laughs> hey, anyway, look, he's, he's... I'm struggling. You know I'm struggling. Yeah, but he nearly, anyway... I mean, he nearly got... He sort of got sort of red cards. Well, he did. He, he got two yellow cards, but it, two yellows don't actually make a red when it comes to a penalty shootout, which nobody seemed to have known about because of the way he was reacting to the Lil crowd. What would you call the Lil crowd? The Lil Lillians. 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 The Lillians. But anyway, the villains beat the Lillians. Mm. So Aston Villa came through and won on penalties, so they are through. So well done to them. Not so good for Liverpool, although they beat Atalanta 1-0 away. Not good enough because they lost 3-0 at home last week. So Liverpool are out of the Europa League and West Ham. They got a draw against Bayer Leverkusen, who everybody seems to lose to. And they're mm. the Bundesliga champions. It's a good result for them, but not good enough because they lose 3-1 on yeah. aggregate. Mm. So they're out of the Europa League as well. Now, interesting weekend ahead, because it's yes. the London Marathon. Now, if you were running the London Marathon this year, Paul... Yes. ..you could possibly be the oldest person ever to run it. Which well, would be irony, because you were the youngest person I ever to I was the youngest it. person ever to run it, although I did lie about my age. Poor well. Hugh is probably really annoyed about this, because <laughs> I always seem to bring it, it up. Uh, mention it again. The race director, Hugh Brasher, is speaking to us now about the weekend. There's Hugh. Morning, Hugh. Good morning, Paul. Yes, I know you pulled the wool over our eyes uh, many years ago, but, uh, yeah, hopefully that wouldn't happen now. It was my fake moustache and beard, I think, that made me look 18 instead of actually 17. But the, the race... Actually, I want to talk about this first, because for those that don't know, your dad, Chris Brasher, a legendary runner himself, along with John Disley, started this back in 1981. So I'm thinking, how old were you around this time, and do you remember the first ones? Yeah, You're far I was, too young. Uh, I know I was, fi I was 15 at the time, so you can work out how old I am now. I was 15 at the time, and he wrote me into... It was school holidays. Uh, it was March, uh, March the 29th, and he wrote me in to sell the train tickets. So I sold 6,300 train tickets uh, to, to all the runners. These days, your, your running number gets you free travel on the, uh, on, on the rail network, but in those days, you had to pay 50p. Yes, I still, still got my ticket, and... Tell me, though, when did you take over them? Was it always written that you were going to be the one that would inherit the whole race? No, no, absolutely far from it. Mm. I, I, was re I was a retailer. I had uh, built up a chain of specialist running stores. I had 43. I sold those, that, that chain. Um, and the job advert came up and, and I applied for it. But, uh, and it's, it's just been an amazing journey. I've been the race director since, since 2012. And... Uh, you know the journey that the marathon has gone on in itself in 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 getting bigger and uh, more impactful has just been quite incredible and the team that put it on are so passionate about inspiring people to get active and it it is a day that london comes together it's a day that the world comes together and and in a world where where there's so much division it really is such a force for good it really is. It's just the most wonderful event, whether you're running in it and whether you're actually there spectating. Where, where are we with, with numbers these days, Hugh? Is it bigger than it's ever been? Yeah, we're, we're expecting record numbers, over 50,000 finishers. Um, so I was told when I started the job you couldn't have more than 36,000 people on the course. Um, actually, through, through crowd management and some interesting software, um, we now do a very different start process to what we used to do. And, and it is the most popular marathon on the planet, over 578 thousand people wow. applied last year to get into the event and that was in a, a, a seven day window so the the uh, the the ballot the entry system opens tomorrow so if you start getting inspired and, and and honestly even if you think you couldn't do a marathon i promise you you can do the london marathon well the Stephen crowd. is nodding here and he wants to do the london marathon no, next I year and i think it's a wonderful thing <laughs> that uh, that Stephen, you're going to do your first london marathon next year i think fantastic what what about will you get your super shoes I, I imagine, yes. are there more finishes than ever? I guess, are these super shoes making a difference now, Hugh, with speeds and also with times now? Yeah, but they also make a big difference on recovery as well. Yeah. So it's not one of the things that's spoken about so much. So, you know, I, I remember the last time I did the marathon, which was 2003, my father had died six weeks before and I thought it would be a good thing to do. Yeah. I hadn't done any training. I couldn't walk down the stairs for the next 
four days. Yeah. So the super shoes, they're so much more bouncy. Yes, they can make you go faster, but the recovery is so much better. Tell me about Tiggs the Sifa. Now, she's the world record holder. The, I know you've got three of the four greatest female marathon runners of all time are going to be taking part on Sunday. Uh, is there chances that we may see a new world record? Because she smashed it, didn't she, last year in Berlin by, I think it was about two minutes. Yeah, look, she absolutely did smash it. We've got nine women that have run under two hours, 17 and 30 seconds. And the, the current women's only world records, this is women running on their own, um, is 2.17.01, which was set by Mary Katani on the London course. Yeah. So we absolutely, you know, the weather gods are looking good. It's a marathon. It's so difficult to predict. But if there was a prediction, I believe that the women's only world record will go on Sunday. Tiggist obviously is the favourite, but honestly, any one of those women is quite capable of doing it. It's going to be a fantastic race. Very exciting. And is there going to be a tribute to, to Kelvin Kiptum, now the world record men's hold, holder that uh, was killed in a car crash, wasn't he, sadly, back in February and also won the race last year? Is there something that you've got planned for him? Absolutely. I mean, Kelvin was only 24 when he was tragically killed in February in this in this car crash. And uh, he had, you know, he had a very short career. He had won Valencia in December 2022, the Valencia Marathon, the fastest ever debutante. He came to London. He broke Elliot Kipchoge's course record um, and ran the fastest ever half marathon in a marathon in the history of yep. the event. Uh, and then he went and broke the world record in Chicago. So we're going to ask the runners to, to a 30 seconds of applause to remember the man, to celebrate the life that he had. Um, and we know that London will embrace that thought and celebrate his, his tragically short life, but a life that had impact. Lovely, and he should have been the Olympics, shouldn't he, this year? But um, we wish the family well and wish everybody well at the weekend. Um, I guess this is the, the, the better time for you now. All the work's done, though, isn't it? Now we're all ready to go. Uh, yeah, we've still got, you know, we're re registering all the runners at the moment. Um, so we're, we, we've had record, we've registered record numbers the last two days, so I'm sure that's going to carry on. Um, but, yeah, we've got 10,000 kids in the TCS Mini London Marathon tomorrow. So uh, 10,000 kids is, is, is an interesting challenge for the team. <laughs> um, and uh, they're either going to be running one mile or 2.6K, and they're some of the best runners in the country. Every runner is getting actually paid, every child is getting paid £10 by TCS, the sponsor, to, um, to, to do the event. It goes towards their either computer equipment or sports equipment at their schools. So it's an incredible um, uh, event, and it's sold out, not surprisingly, in 24 hours. Well, wow. Hugh, have a great weekend. It's always a pleasure. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Paul. Look out for Mr... Stephen, who is going to be Mr. looking, Steven. Mr. Stephen, who's going to be doing the uh, London Marathon next year? No, I, I, you going and, and you know, I always feel off because Hugh is always so, in, I mean, obviously <laughs> enthusiastic about it, and I know a lot of people are so passionate about the marathon. I can't think of anything worse. <laughs> <Can> you, <laughs> yeah. Okay, fine. It's the stuff. It's it's the stuff of nightmares it's for me. It's tough, though. but it's something. It's the, the achievement afterwards. I just you see people crossing the it. line. I remember my dad saying to me when I crossed the line. He said, "Son, you're a man now. You've done a man's job." And Did then I burst really? into tears. Yeah. Did he really? Never forget that. Never forget that. Yeah, yeah. Oh. But, oh, makes me feel like that. Just well, thinking about it. Oh, oh that's oh, really that's sweet. Nice. Actually. That is nice. And then he looked at the time and said, what the... <laughs> what, are, what are you call that? Five yeah, you've hours? Run, you've run a boy's <laughs> time. <laughs> really, stuff, Paul, thank you. Now, do stay with us. We're going to be going through the papers next with Mike Buckley and Ella Whelan. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3pm. J.K. Rowling has accused politicians of snuggling up to trans campaigners. The Harry Potter author has called for an investigation into why political parties are embracing the language of pro-trans groups. So is it time to ditch campaign groups such as those? Well, welcome again to Michael Asher's former Labour Party advisor Matthew Laza, also businessman and activist Adam Brooks. I think the cash report is really welcome. I think there's been a huge amount of agreement, including from some uh, 
trans rights campaign is that there's an awful lot of good in the CAS report. I, I, I think that I'm more concerned about Mermaids, which is currently under a charity commission uh, investigation, uh, and some of the reports, if they're to be believed, like sending out chest binders, are more alarming. Mm. I think on Stonewall, which has been has done such great work uh, over the past 30 years uh, uh, on LGBT rights... It said well, two-year-olds you... could be trans. Now, that, that is one of the most horrifying things I read today. Actually, J.K. Rowling tweeted that out there. To say that a two-year-old can think that they can be another gender when my four-year-old still thinks she's Elsa on some days. You yeah. know, there's no common sense. And, and it, to me, it's I very... Think it was very badly phrased, it's, very, it's very sinister that these people actually believe that these kids want to change gender. And, and unfortunately out there, there are parents that almost see a trans kid as a fashion accessory now. And I think this whole... Um, agenda has pushed on people that this is normal to change gender and we have to push back and as I said earlier to be trans is not normal. Well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't agree it's with that phrasing. I think, no, I think it's, it's I think extreme. It's a big step, Adam, but there are clearly people throughout history uh, uh, who, who have uh, been But it's trans. not normal behaviour, is it? I think, for, I think as far as children are concerned, children need to be given the space uh, to, um, uh, to explore the world, and that can mm. include experimenting with, uh, you know, um, uh, breaking previous gender stereotypes. That doesn't mean that people should be sort of labelled at the age of two, which I completely uh, disagree mm. with. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. If you want your news to be straight talking... This is the nightmare for the Conservatives again. ...down to earth. It's not just Nottingham where this is happening, is it? And most importantly, honest. Hard-working, middle-class taxpayers, they'll get their book thrown at them. Then catch me, Martin Daubney, Monday to Friday, 3 to 6pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Emily Carver. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Time to see what's in the papers this morning with former Labour advisor Mike Buckley and the journalist Ella Whelan. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Let's kick off with um, what may or may not be going on between Israel and Iran, first and foremost, Ella. Yes, so um, there's been a little bit more news come out. US officials have told CBS News that this did happen um, and it's been confirmed that there was a strike. Um, the state broadcaster in Iran has very much downplaying reports, suggesting, saying that there's essentially not been any damage, that there's nothing really much happened. And that it could have been, it could, could have come internally. Yes, yeah, so... Uh, from infiltrators. Yeah, it downplaying the... Well, it is as yet, obviously, unconfirmed. We haven't had a statement from Israel. There's been no um, official kind of lid put on this, but Iran potentially suggesting that this wasn't what anybody thinks it is. Um, that hasn't stopped a broader response um, from other countries. So Australia coming out and telling um, its citizens in Israel essentially to leave mm. um, and putting out quite a frightened sounding message um, about the potential for conflict and danger and, and telling Australians to get out of there. The US has restricted travel for um, people working in its embassy, its embassy staff in Israel for similar reasons, saying that they need to be overly cautious despite um, any sort of lack of clarity on what exactly has happened. But that's relatively significant. Um, you know, it's certainly a shift um, in terms of uh, approach to how people should be feeling in Israel. And there are sort of wider commentary about what any of this sort of this uh, potential for an open war, whether or not Iran retaliates in an extreme way or not, but the fact that this has changed to direct conflict between the two nations, what that means for people living in Iran, but also in Israel, lots of different people all over the world live there. Mm. Yeah. Mike, what do you make of it? I mean, it's of great concern. I mean, the whole the whole situation, I mean, particularly obviously between Israel, particularly in Gaza, I mean, that's all still happening and uh, Israeli forces are still there. There are people still dying and enough aid is still not getting in. So we need to not forget that that's, that's the major thing. But of course, this widening across the region 
is of great concern. And this is something that Joe Biden, for example, and Rishi Sunak and Anke Starmer and you know, other world leaders have all been trying to put pressure on Israel and other nations in the region to, the, to so that we don't get to this point. So we are now at this point of direct conflict between Israel and Iran, which is something that people have been trying to prevent and worried about for years. And at the moment, it's all happening at quite a small scale. Iran particularly seems this morning to be downplaying the impact of the strike from Israel and say, you know, well, there hasn't been much damage. But it has also said, we will respond immediately. They haven't responded yet, as far as we know. Iran has also said that a continuing attacks from Israel may make it review its nuclear stance. So at the moment, it's saying it doesn't have nuclear weapons, but it may seek to develop nuclear weapons, and apparently has the capability to do so if it feels further threatened by Israel. And of course, that is something that the no, none of us who want to live in a safe world or want that region to be safe as well um, will want to see happen. So this is of great concern, even though today the good news is damage has been minimal. Mm, OK, mm. let's go from one uh, unfortunate hotspot to another, Mike, uh, in The Times, looking at um, the ongoing situation in Ukraine. And a man's been arrested um, for allegedly um, spying and, and, and planning a plot to kill President Zelensky. Yes, yeah, so apparently uh, there's a, an airport in Poland just over the border from Ukraine, which is used relatively regularly by Zelensky uh, to travel when he goes overseas rather than flying directly from Ukraine. And it's also used by Western leaders when they're going to Ukraine. They fly in there and then travel on by, by train or car. So this person made himself aware, apparently, to Russian authorities, to the Russian Secret Service, and said, I would be willing to help you kill Zelensky. And then the Russians then said to him, oh, well, if you could find out security arrangements at this airport and find out where they're lax. So thankfully, the Polish authorities have found out and they've now arrested him. But this just, you know, it's another thing that goes to show just how far the Russians will go to win this war. That, of course, puts further pressure on us, puts further pressure on Europe and indeed on the US as well, to do everything we possibly can to help Ukraine and win this war. And of course, the wider context of the minute is that, very sadly, the West is not doing enough to help uh, Ukraine win this war. Ukraine is constantly saying to the West, we need more weapons, we need, um, we need air support. Um, and there is going to be a vote in the US Congress this weekend because they've been for months now uh, delaying on voting on a support deal for Ukraine. So hopefully that will go through this weekend, which could be transformative. Mm. Ella, do you think the West is doing enough to support Ukraine? Uh, well, um, it depends what you mean by support. Obviously, in terms of money, there's the terrible row going on in America about whether or not um, they will continue sending it and the prospect of a uh, Trump presidency is, I think, probably making a lot of people in Ukraine very nervous because it's unsure about how Republicans will actually respond to that. But it's, it's strange to talk about conflicts in this way, and um, don't get me the wrong way, but I think it's been... Un unfortunate for Ukraine's cause in a way what's happening in the Middle East because it's taken attention away from them. And, you know, that sounds mm. strange, but what I mean is no, that no, no. the world okay. was focused on um, what was happening. We were, you know, daily reporting news on what was happening in Ukraine and it has taken a backseat. And that's despite the fact that nothing has changed, that Russian aggression hasn't lessened, that there hasn't, you know, that there hasn't been any sort of resolution to that conflict, as we know. And so, in a way... Um, you know, f highlighting failed plots like this makes reminds people of how live this issue is, of how important it is to still remember that this what's happening in Ukraine affects the whole of the world and is something we need to keep talking about. Mm. Mm. All right, um, let's move a little bit closer to home, should we? Um, for some people uh, watching and listening, anyway, and it's in the Guardian this morning, looking at Thames Water. Um, could be renationalised, the Guardian claims. The government's looking at that. Yes, and you had Mel Stride on um, earlier in this programme, sort of dampening so, that a little bit, saying, no, 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 there's no official no, no reports. Yeah. Mm. Uh, also making the assurance, I thought, I saw Snicket, yeah. that absolute guarantee that water will still come out of your tap. Yeah. You think, that's a low bug. Good uh, well, Lord, yeah. I mean. Um, but Might cost you about 20 quid a glass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But... <laughs> and be full of you know, sewage. But anyway, there's the important point is that if you look, The Guardian highlights that back when um, Thames Water was taken out of public ownership in 1989, it had zero debt. Um, so, and now there's a debt um, 
bill of 15.6 billion. Um, you know, we know that it's a completely failing organisation, whether it's sort of um, leakages, the issue of sewage, the, the you know, constant question of things not working properly, right down to sort of structural issues. Something needs to be done about this. Um, taking it into public ownership or an arm's length public ownership isn't going to be the magic mm. um, solution because you need to have a strong functioning organised state to do that and we know that we currently do not have that whether it's in relation to Rwanda or any other plans. Mm. Um, so this is a, de it's a depressing story. I mean the sort of background to why this has happened is in part the Guardian highlights shareholders siphoning out billions in dividends and stripping it basically and then you know the, the issue that a lot of the Thames Water infrastructure is very, very old, mm. uh, unrepaired, doesn't work, is under a lot of stress in terms of you know, population growth and all the rest of it. Mm. Um, but there seems to be no real big plan to deal with what is a basic need, necessity of life of having clean, accessible, cheap water, because let's not forget that the bills keep going up. I suppose mm. the, the, the problem is with this, who's going to want to buy it? If if the the infrastructure costs everything are going to be so high, is nationalisation going to be the only way forward? Despite the fact it's going to cost us a whole heap of money. Well, the reports out this morning were talking about the government nationalising and then reprivatising it, as they've done with a number of other failed privatisations. But if that happens, we need we need as a country the next government uh, needs to think about changing the model. The model we have in the minute means that company any privatised company, including this one. Their, their number one job, like any private company, is to maximise shareholder profit. Of course, in the public utility, that is not good, and that is what has led to the fact that there's been so little investment in reservoirs or maintaining infrastructure you know, for the last 30 years. So billions have been siphoned out in profits. They've got 15.6 billion in debt, which maybe which would obviously be nationalised with the company who would go onto the government balance sheet. Meanwhile, prices are going up, and they haven't been investing in making sure that the water is a drinkable, available, that sewage doesn't leak into rivers, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. We've now got the almost inevitable problems that we've got. So if the water system is going to stay privatised, we need a change in the model so that its primary purpose is to ensure that investment happens and so that people get cheap water and clean water coming out of their taps and sewage that goes where it needs to go rather than into rivers, rather than billions siphoned off into shareholder profits. But you're right. I mean, the, the question then is, well, who's going to buy it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Big question. Less, um, Mike, should we look at Brexit travel hope for UK students? It's on the front page of the eye this morning. Yes, so this, of course, looks like it's come out of nowhere. It hasn't really come out of nowhere because obviously Brexit happened four years ago, freedom of movement ended. So, you know, before that, we could travel to any country in the e <laughs> EU to live and work or study or anything like that. And of course, you Europeans could come here. So that ended. Um, the, since then, the government, our government, has recognised that we have a need for inward migration because we have labour shortages in part because we have, a, we have an ageing population. So the number of immigrants coming into the country, of course, has gone up. Meanwhile, the, our government has been running around the EU to some of the larger, more, more you know, Western Europe nations like France, Germany, Spain and others, trying to get a bespoke movement deal between our country and their country so that we can meet our inward migration needs from there as well. All those countries have said no to the UK. They don't want to do that because what the EU wants is a deal that covers the whole of the EU and it includes all of those countries rather than just some of the, the richer ones in the West. So this is in fact a response to our government going and saying we would quite like some movement deals with some of these other nations. But with, everyone's going mad at the migration numbers. That's part of a million people. They are, but that's partly because we have a government that is essentially doing one thing while saying to the country they're going to do something else. So the government knows full well we have an ageing population, which means the proportion of older people who are not working is growing, the proportion of working age country is shrinking. This is just because of birth rates over the last, you know, 60 or 70 years. So there's no way out of it now. This is the reality. This is the UK. We need, therefore, to import working age people Otherwise, the society will not function, whether it's business or public sector services or anything else. So the government knows that. They're running around the planet trying to get people to come to the UK to work. At the same time, they're saying to the general public, gosh, immigration is a terrible thing. We must bring the numbers down. Right, just, so it's completely disingenuous. Just in 30 seconds, Ella. I just think it's interesting that the European Union has always painted itself as this lovely in pro-internationalist. We love everyone going ev anywhere all the time. Let's all mix together. And a lot of the time, they stand in the way of any kind of actual internationalist approach. And there can be a post-Brexit internationalist approach, just not freedom of movement, which was a particular policy with a particular set of strings attached. Mm. Okay. okay. Ella, Mike, thank you both very much indeed. We shall see you both a little bit 
later on. We've got all the headlines coming up, of course, yep, very shortly as well, everything that's going on this morning. We're also going to have the weather with Aidan McGiven. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome to the latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Rain clearing the southeast today, followed by further showers for many of us, accompanied by cool, blustery winds, although skies do brighten later in time for a sunny start to the weekend. Here's the picture by mid-morning, a lot of cloud on the map. Showers affecting many places, particularly central and eastern areas. Skies, though, do brighten across much of central and western Scotland, and then later on, western parts of the rest of the UK. We keep the showers going through the Midlands, the southeast as well, accompanied by a cool and gusty wind. That's going to make it feel a little disappointing, I think, with highs of 12 to 15 Celsius. Nevertheless, the showers across central areas do fade away into the evening. The skies tend to clear as well and the wind eases. As a result, with lengthy clear skies, a lighter wind, Temperatures will fall through the night, touch of frost even as we begin Saturday. So gardeners beware, there will be some frostiness first thing, but there'll be plenty of bright skies as well. Lots of sunshine lifting those temperatures fairly quickly through the morning. So if you're out and about first thing, it will soon warm up and there'll be plenty of sunshine until around the afternoon when the clouds will tend to build, particularly for central and northern parts of the country. And for the far north of Scotland, we're going to see some light outbreaks of rain move in here, making it feel cool elsewhere with lighter winds feeling pleasant enough. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding in the Highland. The A862 is closed in both directions along Clackner Harry Road at Scorgui in Inverness because of a fire. Buses replaced trains again today between Kilmarnock and Strand Ra after a fire near the railway line earlier this week with a half hourly shuttle train running between Eyre and Prestwick Town. There are also some cancelled trains between Cheltenham Spa and Ashchurch for Tewkesbury because of a landslip. Now on the A48M in Cardiff, the outside lane remains closed southbound at St Melons for repairs after an accident earlier this week. In London, the A123 is closed along Cranbrook Road off Beehive Lane in Ilford after an accident overnight with nine bus routes having to divert as a result. And on the M23 from Surrey into West Sussex, the southbound exit at Junction 9 at Gatwick Airport is partly blocked where someone's broken down. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. With thanks to Variety Cruises, a family company sailing since 1942, you have the chance to win a £10,000 seven-night small boat cruise for two. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, you'll be able to choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and explore Greece like never before. Plus, you'll also win £10,000 in tax-free cash to make your summer sizzle. And we'll pack you off with these luxury travel gifts. From another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob rees and this is GB News, Britain's news channel.
Good morning to you. It's 8 o'clock on Friday the 19th of April. Today, the world holds its breath as US sources claim that Israel has launched an attack on Iran in a retaliatory strike. Reports of explosions near a military base in Isfahan. The Work and Pensions Secretary Mel Stride spoke to us earlier. I firmly believe that Israel has a right uh, to self-defence. But at the same time, of course, what we have been impressing upon the Israeli government is the importance of de-escalation at this point. Meanwhile, Iranian state media downplay the attack as the news agency claims the country's nuclear facilities are completely secure. As a senior commander tells them, no damage was done. Well, a senior Iranian official claims there is no plan for immediate retaliation, despite having warned of a severe and immediate response if Israel were to attack. Western governments tell its citizens to leave Israel over fears of a reprisal attack. Also today, the Prime Minister pledges to end the sick note culture in Britain. Yes, 2.8 million people are claiming long-term sickness and disability benefits. It's costing the government, the taxpayer, an absolute fortune. Now there is a crackdown coming. The government says it's going to save money. Charities and some health professionals thinking it's going too far. I'll bring you the details shortly. Well, in the sport this morning, Emmy Martinez's antics in goal. See Aston Villa go through on a penalty shootout to the Europa Conference League semi-final as Liverpool and West Ham go out of the Europa League. Emma Raducanu is playing great injury-free tennis and will be heading to Paris with less than 100 days to the Olympic Games. It's going to be a sunny start to the weekend for many of us as higher pressure finally arrives. But before we get there, Today is another day of bright spells and showers. I'll have the full details in the forecast coming up shortly. Good morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello, and this is Breakfast on GB News. All right, lots to crack on with this morning because Israel has reportedly launched an attack on Iran overnight in a retaliatory strike. Reports of explosions near a military base in Isfahan, at least that's according to US officials. Well, Iranian state media have been quick to downplay the situation, claiming that their air defence systems were able to destroy three drones in the centre of the country. Well, we're yet to hear from Israeli officials about the attack. No one has said... They carried it out. Well, meanwhile, the Australian government has urged its citizens to leave Israel over fears of a revenge attack. Earlier, we spoke to the Work and Pensions Secretary, Mel Stride, who admitted that the key issue here is de-escalation. It's clearly uh, an emerging story, so we don't know the full facts at this stage, and Israel has yet to uh, confirm action or otherwise. Look, I'd make a few points here. I think one is that we firmly believe that Israel has a right uh, to self-defence, but at the same time, of course, what we have been impressing upon the Israeli government is the importance of de-escalation at this point. So whilst we don't know the details at the moment, uh, my hope is that whatever has happened is of a nature uh, where de-escalation can now be the way forward. And of course, we can continue then uh, to focus on the diplomatic work that we and others are doing to ensure that we get humanitarian aid into Gaza. Well, our security editor, Mark White, joins us now. Mark, this is a developing story. Bring us up to date. Well, of course, the G7 foreign ministers are meeting in Italy today, so we can expect some comments from those foreign ministers, from the likes of Lord Cameron, who's across there for the UK. Anthony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, we're told will make comments at some point this morning. You're right to say no official confirmation as yet from Israel, although US media are reporting that they had heard from official sources uh, in the White House that Israel had told the US government prior to launching these apparently limited strikes that they were about to do that. And I say apparently limited, we just don't have much information on what has been targeted and how much potential damage has been caused. 
Iran has been saying this morning that its air defence systems dealt with whatever this threat was uh, and it took down three drones that they say were launched from infiltrators within Iran itself. And certainly I think it would be unusual in the extreme if Israel launched drones uh, from a thousand miles away uh, in Israel towards Iran, slow-moving drones which could be easily taken out by any air defence system, much more likely that this was uh, a missile strike launched by Israel, either um, from Israel uh, or indeed perhaps from aircraft uh, further towards Iran. We have uh, been told as well from uh, Syrian official media sources saying that uh, air defence systems and radar sites in Syria were attacked overnight by Israeli fighter aircraft. So uh, another angle to this. But what's unknown at this stage really uh, is, as I say, the damage, of course, of what sites around uh, Isfahan, which is in central Iran, were targeted. There are reports uh, of other explosions perhaps in a city in northwestern Iran, but that is not confirmed as yet. And the other thing we don't really know at this stage is whether this was intended to be limited to this action and this action only within Iran and anything further that Israel does perhaps is being carried out uh, against proxies or other targets that are outside Iran and maybe conducted in a more slower time uh, approach by Israel, uh, or whether perhaps this is the first phase uh, of what Israel may be planning. That will only really become clear in the hours and days ahead. As I say, the government in Israel hasn't even confirmed that they've carried out any strikes as yet. OK. Mark, thanks very much indeed. Well, let's talk to uh, the former Armed Forces Minister, Mark Francois, who joins us now. Um, are, are you still holding your breath on this, or do you think Israel has listened to the likes of David Cameron and, uh, and showed significant restraint here? Well, uh, it, it, details are still emerging, your correspondent has just said. So... Uh, 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 until we get more detail, it's difficult to know exactly what we're dealing with here. So um, Parliament doesn't usually sit on a Friday, except a number of days when we focus on private members' bills. And the House is sitting today. So as I'm a member of the House of Commons Defence Committee, uh, uh, I, for one, think it's important that because under parliamentary rules, the government can make a statement in the House at any time when the House is sitting, is that we uh, interrupt business this morning, important though it is. My friend uh, Anna Firth has got a private member's bill to try and combat pet theft. I'm actually going in to support her this morning. But I, I think the government should interrupt business this morning and make a statement in the House of Commons to tell Parliament everything we do know about what has happened, and that will allow MPs to question a government minister on what has happened. And, of course, I assume the government priority is going to be de-escalation. Yes, I think it's... Uh, um, I think that's something we, we would all like to see, although I, I would just make the point that when, for instance, President Biden calls on the Israelis to, to de-escalate, uh, you know, if someone was trying to rain down missiles and drones on Washington or New York or Chicago, uh, if, if they were on the receiving end of it, uh, you know, how keen would they be to de-escalate? So I think we have to uh, look at the reality of the situation. It's now very apparent from intelligence reports that Iran was behind the Hamas attack. They put them up to it in order to try and prevent the Saudis signing something called the Abraham Accords, which was a, a sort of peace deal with Israel, if you like, to improve relations in the region. So we now know that Iran were the culprits in that. We know that Iran have been using their proxies, the Houthis, to fire uh, missiles at shipping, including British shipping. We know that Iran finance Hamas. We know that Iran finance 
and train them and the Hezbollah. So that's the context that we are dealing with. And I think we need to be clear eyed about it. And I think we also want to ask the government why, oh, why have we still not prescribed the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization? So there are a number of questions to be asked today in Parliament. So I think it's very, very important that the government offers a statement and shares whatever information they do have with the House of Commons and via the Commons with the nation. What's your assessment of why we've not had any confirmation from Israel on this yet? Um, there may be some intelligence reasons for that. Uh, I don't want to speculate further. What we don't know is whether this is uh, a single strike or whether it's the precursor to further strikes. I'm sure, as you mentioned, you've got the, uh, uh, the foreign ministers meeting today. I'm sure Israel will come under immense pressure to, uh, to make some kind of announcement and to explain to the world what its intentions are, particularly whether or not there is likely to be further action. So we're all slightly in the dark at the moment, no pun intended, because it was an overnight strike. Uh, all the more reason, again, I think that ministers must come to the House of Commons this morning and tell us what they do know. And if that does happen, I'm sure it will be raised in the House. Uh, with this escalating situation in the Middle East, will you be raising the topic of defence spending again, sitting at 2.3% of GDP? Uh, should we be spending more? Well, well, I and my colleagues on the committee have consistently, for years, argued that we should be spending at least 3% of our GDP on defence. That, if you like, has been the committee's policy, for want of a better word, going back to previous chairman like Dr Julian Lewis. He, his slogan was three to keep us free. So we have been... And remember, we're, a, we're an all-party committee. We, we have MPs from four parties, so uh, it's not a partisan point in, in any way. But look, we have... Uh, Russia has invaded Ukraine. Uh, China is making increasingly sulfurous threats towards Taiwan. As I've just said, we've got now this situation in the Middle East. Yes, of course, we should increase our defence spending. And one of the things we should spend the extra money on is a, is a air defence system for the United Kingdom. We don't have anything comparable to the Israeli Iron Dome system. We have the technology to build it but we don't have the money, and this is something the committee has taken evidence on in recent months. We were told that the MOD went to number 10, asked for the money for such a system, and were turned down, which we, we regret. So, of course, we should increase our defence spending. The first duty of government, above all others, is the defence of the realm. And I say that not just as a former armed forces minister or a former TA officer in the Cold War many years ago, but I say that as the son of a D-Day veteran. Chancellor, well, good to see you this morning. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, the idea of an Iron Dome system for the UK, do we really need one? I don't know, I've never thought of that in the past. Mm. It's slightly worrying if, if people are thinking we do require that sort of protection. Um, let's talk to former UK ambassador to the United Nations and national security advisor to the Prime Minister, Sir Mark Lyle Grant. Sir Mark, we appreciate your time this morning. It, it, oh, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to see quite or work out quite what has gone on here. It almost seems like a bit of a, a shadow war going on, in a sense, almost a shot across the bows if Israel indeed was behind this. Uh, from what you've seen, what's your assessment? Well, from what I've seen, and as you rightly say, a lot is still unclear. Um, I think it was uh, an Israeli strike. Um, the fact that they haven't uh, announced it publicly is standard operating procedure for Israel. They still haven't announced that they were behind the attack that destroyed the Iranian consulate in Damascus on the 1st of April. So that is not a surprise. But I think we can take a little bit of encouragement today from the fact that this was a very limited um, Israeli strike, given that the extent of the military capability they have, they could have launched a much wider strike against Iran. Um, so it is more limited. 
And the fact that Iran has responded by downplaying it very much, saying that they shot down uh, missiles or drones that were incoming, there's been no damage on the ground, does suggest that it might be possible to draw on a line under this particular phase of the tit for tat between Israel and Iran. What do you make of that of that shift in rhetoric? Because it has been very, very quick, hasn't it? It was only uh, a day ago when Iran was warning that any response to Israel would be immediate and at maximum level. But then we're, we're hearing in last hour or so that there are no plans for immediate retaliation. Well, Iran does not want a full-scale war with uh, Israel, uh, let alone, of course, the United States. So I, I'm not surprised that they are downplaying this, despite the fiery rhetoric beforehand. The rhetoric initially was designed to deter Israel from any attack. But as they've seen that this attack has come, that it hasn't caused a great deal of damage, they will want to draw the line uh, under this particular phase, because they do not want to get into a direct war with, the, with Israel. They are much happier working through proxies like Hezbollah in Lebanon, like the Houthis in Yemen, for example. So I would not expect Iran to respond to this, provided that Israel is not uh, preparing a bigger and further attack. I mean, this is going to be the issue for, um, for Israel, for Netanyahu in all of this. I mean, someone, you know, who is, you know, pretty far to the right, it has to be said, he's pretty much a hawk when it comes to these sort of things. And yet, um, one of his ministers, Ben Gavir, has tweeted this morning just saying, feeble. Well, we can... The conclusion you draw from this is that he's not very impressed with, with what has been carried out. There is going to be internal pressure in Israel to do more, isn't there? Well, I think there certainly will be, uh, but I think we should also give a little bit of credit to the American and British governments at this point, because they have been saying to Israel very clearly, yes, you have a right to respond, we're not saying you shouldn't, but in anything you do, please make sure it isn't escalatory. And it does appear that Netanyahu, so far at least, has listened um, to that advice. But you're right, he will come under pressure from hardliners in his own war cabinet and more widely to do a lot more than what appears to be just a sort of sighting shot um, against Isfahan. Mm. It looks as though so far, from what we understand, that Israel has heeded the advice of, of Joe Biden and uh, been measured in their response. Um, we, we understand that they had told the U.S. about this strike. Uh, reportedly, the U.S. were furious that they weren't told uh, about the Damascus strike. Uh, but the U.S. will want to be careful, won't it, because it doesn't want to be seen to be implicated in all of this. Yes. I mean, President Biden was very clear right from the start that if there was an Israeli response, um, it wouldn't be uh, with American support. Um, yes, they will offer... Uh, Israel support if Israel is attacked, but they will not participate in or give any support to uh, Israeli offensive military action. Um, and that's what we've seen, because the last thing Joe Biden wants is for America to be dragged into a wider uh, Middle East conflict. The person who's most sort of comfortable in a way with the present situation is Benjamin Netanyahu himself, because let's not forget that ever since the attack last weekend by Iran against Israel, the focus has come off um, Gaza, what's happening in Gaza, that the Americans have been bound in very publicly to the support of the defense of Israel, and Israel's defensive capabilities have been shown to be very impressive because the Iranian attack against Israel was a lot more significant than this latest Israel attack against Iran, and yet it still caused very little damage uh, in Israel. Okay, can I just ask you to explain uh, something to us? As our, our former ambassador to the United Nations, you understand these, these uh, relationships better than most of us. Every, every now and then, when we discuss what's going on with Iran and Iran funding these proxy groups and all the rest of it, we then hear that, well, Iran's closest friend is Russia. Do we, do we think that the relationship between Russia and Iran is, is strong enough that perhaps some of this is... I mean, would you think some of this is being orchestrated from Moscow or is that conspiracy? 
No, I think that is conspiracy. Um, Iranian-Russian relations have traditionally not been uh, all that close, but they have become a lot closer since the Russian invasion of Ukraine because Iran has provided a lot of attack drones to Russia which are being used against uh, Ukraine. So in the last two years, relations between Russia and Iran have become a lot closer. But no, I do not think that Moscow wants to get involved. It has enough on its hands um, in the war in Ukraine. They certainly don't want to get directly involved in any Middle East conflict at this stage. Okay. So, Mark, really appreciate your time this morning. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. As is a developing situation, we'll keep you across mm -hmm. all of the details uh, on breakfast this morning. But for now, Aidan McGiven has the weather. Warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome to the latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Rain clearing the southeast today, followed by further showers for many of us, accompanied by cool, blustery winds, although skies do brighten later in time for a sunny start to the weekend. Here's the picture by mid-morning, a lot of cloud on the map. Showers affecting many places, particularly central and eastern areas. Skies, though, do brighten across much of central and western Scotland, and then later on, western parts of the rest of the UK. We keep the showers going through the Midlands, the southeast as well, accompanied by a cool and gusty wind. That's going to make it feel a little disappointing, I think, with highs of 12 to 15 Celsius. Nevertheless, the showers across central areas do fade away into the evening. The skies tend to clear as well, and the wind eases. As a result, with lengthy clear skies, a lighter wind, temperatures will fall through the night. Such a frost even as we begin Saturday, so gardeners beware. There will be some frostiness first thing, but there will be plenty of bright skies as well. Lots of sunshine, lifting those temperatures fairly quickly through the morning. So if you're out and about first thing, it will soon warm up and there'll be plenty of sunshine until around the afternoon when the clouds will tend to build, particularly for central and northern parts of the country. And for the far north of Scotland, we're going to see some light outbreaks of rain move in here, making it feel cool elsewhere with lighter winds feeling pleasant enough. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Now, there is some good news. There's still plenty of time to grab your chance to win a Greek cruise, travel goodies and a £10,000 tax-free cash bank balance boost. Wow, here's all the details that you need. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel Gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'll be glad when that one's over. It's the music. Because the music sets her off every... She just sits there <laughs> dancing, shaking it. Feels like you're already abroad in Greece. Yeah. yeah. Be nice, that. Would be nice, wouldn't it? I'd love a summer holiday. I feel like we need a holiday. Mm. Anyway, maybe one day. Okay. Maybe one day. Um, anyway, still to come. The government is vowing to crack down on sick note Britain. We'll tell you more in a couple of minutes. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. I wonder, is this the fundamental distinction we need to make between Islam, which is a, a, a private religion, people may practice freely uh, amongst themselves, and Islamism, when you try and place those values upon other people, place that, that way of being, force it on people who don't want it? 
Um, I have been very much clear about this thing that Islam is a religion and people are free to follow that religion in the UK, in a Western, free Western society. So we, we have no problem with people following their religion as long as it is not being imposed mm. onto the wider society and when you would uh, you talk about uh, drawing a distinction between islam and islamism people like me you and me we are drawing that distinction we're trying to maintain that distinction but if you uh, look at the commentator from the muslim community some commentator they would like to blur this line and they would ask you what is islamism where does it exist sorry it does exist mm. we see it and the teacher this incident is an epitome of that kind of, you know, ideology being prevalent, you know, in, in our Khadija, society. Khadija, do you worry so, that there are, that these views are typical for some sections of society? Do you think that there's a problem with some Muslim men that they have perhaps uh, views that we don't consider to be British values? There are certain readings of religion which are misogynistic, which are discriminatory, which are homophobic. We need to be honest about it. We need to be calling it out whenever we hear these kind of views. It's been a long time that we are letting these kind of ideologies crawling in, you know, um, spreading tentacles in British society, and we are just ignoring it in the name of respecting people's culture and mm. religion. You are not suppressing the UK. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Every Saturday, 10 till 12, we'll bring you all of the news that you need to know. We'll also remind you that there is so much to smile about. It's my favourite time of the week. I get to relax, enjoy some light-hearted stories and let Ellie teach me about fashion too. <laughs> That's Saturday Morning Live, every Saturday, 10 till 12. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. This is GB News, Britain's election channel. Now, the Prime Minister is going to unveil a package of welfare reform measures. He wants to tackle what he's calling Britain's sick note culture. Yes, the government claim it has resulted in a significant rise in people being unnecessarily written off work and parked on welfare. Well, earlier we spoke to Work and Pension Secretary Mel Stride. The at the moment is that we have a growing number of people going on to long-term sickness benefits. There are 2.8 million people on those benefits at the moment. We know that a reasonable proportion of those people, for example, want to work. And what I'm all about is making sure that in that journey that sometimes people are taking from work through a fit note, uh, then into longer-term sickness benefits, that at each stage of that journey we do whatever we can to support people into work. Let's talk to our political correspondent, Catherine Forster, who's in Westminster for us this morning. So your doctor won't be able to write you a sick note or a fit note that they're called for some completely unknown reason. Um, but instead, you'll be sent off to see a work coach. Yes, well, that's the plan, and we'll be hearing more from the Prime Minister in the next hour or so. But basically, the government are incredibly worried about the big rise in the number of people off on long-term sick. It stands at the moment at 2.8 million. That's up some 700,000 since before the pandemic. And it's horrifically expensive for the government and ultimately for taxpayers. Um, some £69 billion pounds a year once you include the cost of benefits and also the housing costs associated with that and that's projected to rise to 90 billion by the end of the next parliament so they need to do something and now rishi sunak is going to say today that the focus needs to be the default becomes what work you can do not what work you can't because the 11 million fit notes uh, issued uh, last year 94 percent of those basically said that the person wasn't able to do 
any work at all. Now, the government wants people to be working if they possibly can, says it's good for their mental health as well. So the plan, it seems, is potentially to strip the GP of the power to sign people off sick. They're proposing instead something that... Uh, um, uh, Mel Stride, the Work and Pension Secretary, is calling Work Well, basically bringing together a medical professional with uh, people from the benefits team and working out together um, how they can keep them in work if possible, give them the support they need. Now, um, that's all very well. I think that will be huge, hugely challenging, though obviously uh, the need for this is, is clear. Um, but given the pressures within the NHS, uh, given the shortage of doctors, given the waiting lists, uh, I think it will be quite difficult for them to get this up and running. And of course, they're already coming in for a lot of criticism um, because Rishi Sunak is expected to say that, you know, there's a risk of over medicalizing the everyday challenges and worries of life because uh, a lot of the claims now are related to mental health, uh, anxiety and depression. Charities very, very worried about people being effectively vilified and not supported. So this is a very difficult nettle for the government to grasp, but one that they feel they must grasp. Um, I think it's going to be very challenging for them. Uh, challenging and controversial, as you say, especially with those mental health charities. Catherine Forster, live for us in Westminster. Thank you very much indeed. And we'll hear more from the Prime Minister, won't we, in the next hour or so on those plans. Do let us know what you think of them as well. GBnews.com slash your say. Well, coming up in just a few minutes, Paul Coit is going to have all the sport for you this morning and he's looking ahead to the Olympics in just 100 days. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. In the Highland, the A862 is closed in both directions along Clackner Harry Road at Scorgui in Inverness because of a fire. Buses replaced trains again today between Kilmarnock and Stranra after a fire earlier this week with a half alley shuttle train running between Eyre and Prestwick Town on the M62 in West Yorkshire. There's a lane closed eastbound after a vehicle caught fire between junctions 22 and 23 from Rishworth Moor to Huddersfield causing queues. There are some cancelled trains between Cheltenham Spa and Ash church for Tewkesbury because of a landslip. On the A48M in Cardiff, the outside lane remains closed southbound at St Melons for repairs after an accident earlier this week. In Essex on the A12, the inside lanes closed northbound at junction 22 north of Whitham after an accident causing queues. And in London, Cranbrook Road in Ilford's closed after an accident. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. 
Join me, Neil Oliver, every Sunday night at 6pm on GB News. And if an hour is not nearly enough for you, go to gbnews.com for special extended episodes online every Friday at 9pm, where we can truly get into the nitty gritty of what's going on. GB News, Britain's news channel. Paul's here with all your sport. Good morning. Good morning. Morning. Or should I say, bonjour. Bonjour. Lille were beaten by Aston Villa uh, yesterday, last night in the Conference League, the Europa Conference League. You know, it was it was two one up to Aston Villa, heading over to France, and then Lille won two one, and then basically it went on, went to penalties. Emmy Martinez, who's a bit of a handful, Argentinian goalkeeper who was, I don't know, his, his antics and it tries to put everybody off. He got a second yellow card during the penalty shootout, which everybody would think that's being a sending off. But apparently, you, I, I didn't even know this, and most sports people didn't. No. That, two yellow cards when it gets to a penalty shootout, you don't get sent off. So we'll be banned from the semi-final. But Aston Villa are through. Liverpool are out of the Europa. Uh, they uh, beat Atalanta in Italy yesterday, but it wasn't enough. They won 1-0. They needed to win by at least three. And West Ham drew 1-1 with Bayer Leverkusen, who yes. Ellie won the... Uh, the Bundesliga. Um, yeah, the Bundesliga, yes. yes. They've been doing very well. They have been doing very well. Yes, yes, yes. So, yes, yeah, so they're through. <laughs> Tell you who else has been doing very well. Mm. Emma Raducanu. Emma Raducanu. How She's on the up. Yeah. You know what? We, I, I've always tried to avoid having a go at Emma Raducanu because it's it's very easy to knock Raducanu after she won the US Open because she hasn't had much luck. She's had injuries. It's been just it just hasn't worked out for her. Uh, but playing in the Stuttgart Open, there she is playing on clay. Very good. She beat Linda Noskova. Um, she beat her very soundly actually. Six love seven five. She plays the world number one, Iga Swiatek in Stuttgart later this afternoon at 4 oh. o'clock. So that will be a true test to it see will how be. well she's really doing. Oh, fingers crossed. Right? Let's hope so, yeah. And I thought it might be nice, since it's the 100 days. Uh, oh, you... No, 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 no. rewind, rewind, leave no, it. No, because I had a perfect question ready for you. Oh, did you? I was going to say, combien de jours avant les Jeux Olympiques de Paris? Sur le bridge d'Avignon. Oh, Sur le yes. pont d'Avignon. Yes, the yes. answer to it, which is... 100 days. 100 days. Well, it's actually, we're 97 now. Oh. Which is? Oh, now we're struggling. <laughs> I let's, don't know. Let's have a chat. My, my favourite French journalist works for Le Keep, and he's a legend when it comes to sports journalism. Uh, and his name is Eric Bielderman, and he's in Paris right now. Hi, Eric. Hi, Paul. Good to speak to you. Were you impressed by the French we were speaking there? It's getting better every day, isn't it, before the Olympics? Yeah, yeah, I am impressed that, uh, you know, it's 1970 days that you had the, the proper answer and that you know everything about the Ab Avignon Bridge. So yeah. you are... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> See, I knew you'd be the guy that we would have on. Listen, Ted, let, before we uh, get on to some other stuff, but, but with the Paris Olympics, how does everybody in Paris feel about this? Because I remember how it was back in 2012, just before the Olympics began, and there was kind of an opposition and people going, oh, I don't think it's a good idea, and then everybody bought into it and everybody loved it. What's the view over in Paris at the moment? Uh, you know, in Paris, uh, for let's say ten years, uh, the city is is a chaos in terms of the of the the, tr the transformation of the city itself. So uh, uh, the Olympics game have had it chaos to chaos in terms of transportation about uh, uh, all the the, the the duties all 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 over the cities. But behind that, uh, there is a big hope uh, that everything will be ready in time. And at the moment, it looks like. It is in terms of uh, the stadium facilities. Uh, uh, let's say, look at the Eiffel Tower, or close to the Eiffel Tower. Yeah. There is new uh, stadium, uh, 13,000 emerging for uh, some uh, some sports around them, and this is on time. And on that side, we are quite optimistic. Are you going to welcome? We know what uh, friendly people the Parisians are. Are you going to welcome mm -hmm. us with open arms as we head over there, Eric? Oh, uh, you know, uh, most of the Parisians they will escape from uh, from Paris. Oh, is that right? Are they not going? see too much of us. 
we know we know that uh, uh, in a city uh, usually uh, Olympic Games uh, makes uh, the, the 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 life very complicated for for the people. We have been said uh, by the French government uh, do a TV do TV job more than uh, going uh, to uh, to where you have you are allegedly uh, supposed to go to work. So for most of the people who are allowed to work from their home, they will do it. And on my side, I will fly 5,000 kilometers away from Paris uh, on the early stage of the Olympics. You'll obviously be no. right in the middle of it, though. I mean, Eric's going to be in the oh, middle of it. You've yeah. covered World Cups, haven't you? And Rugby World Cup, and I know, and, and racing and everything. But for you, uh, in the centre there at Le Keep and being a sports journalist as you are, this must be the ultimate for you, though, Eric, right? It is. It is the ultimate for... I work on Formula One, so that's why I'm travelling all over the world uh, and not uh, following the Olympics uh, on stage. But I do follow up uh, what we what we are preparing about this event. We have just published uh, a special edition, 100 pages of L'Equipe for the 100 days before the Olympic. This is a huge event. And the, the, the newspaper, we have more than 60 journalists just uh, uh, having credential to work on the, on this Olympics. This is the event of the century for us as a, as a French media and French and French uh, sports uh, backing uh, fans. That's that's obvious. But uh, behind that, uh, we can't compare Olympics to a World Cup. I think the World Cup in 1998, when we did organize it, there was something in the air. Uh, I would say like something magic. So yeah. far, it's a bit of uh, being a bit cautious about, oh, it will work. Uh, it, look, it's going to be great for, for Paris, though, isn't it? Just generally speaking, Eric. I mean, I know it's a, it's a city that struggles to get tourists to come along. So, yeah. finally, something to go for. <laughs> oh, you know, uh, you will have some good food. You will have some... <laughs> Some good weather because uh, we we do believe it will be very hot summer. Uh, we do believe that uh, in terms of security, everything is done uh, to make it uh, to make it safe. Uh, Paris is a, is a brilliant city. Uh, we do live in it, so we don't realize it. When I come to London, I think this is the very best city in the world. I feel like to be a holiday man in in London, and I always. Uh, feel upset when I am in Paris, but you will be uh, our guest, and I'm sure you will enjoy uh, the, the the funny side of Paris and the, the dreamland that Paris can be on a certain extent. So uh, please come enjoy, and uh, I will uh, I will watch it for for from far. But I'm sure I will be very jealous that you will be on stage at this time. Eric, we wish you well. And, um, you know, I love Paris, I love the Olympics, and I have a feeling that this could be the second greatest Olympics there's ever been. <laughs> so, best of luck, and we look forward to speaking to you again soon, Eric. You take care. Uh, Cheers. Eric Bielderman. He's great, isn't he? Eric? Oh, yeah, he's yeah, very yeah. good. Yeah. He's not really talk French, by the way. He's from Hackney. You never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I remember Antoine de Cun. Yes, yes. From Euro Trash. Yes. My father was convinced he wasn't actually French. Yes, yeah. He's just putting that voice on. You can see, I'll see, yeah, and then see, the nice. Brilliant. I love Paris in the springtime. <laughs> oh, oh wow. Well, I was there not long ago. Was it? Oh, for yeah, for my half century. But, you're, but you've noticed it, haven't you? The, the, you can see across Paris how everything is Looking around the Olympics, clean. isn't it? So oh, yeah. everything. You know yeah, that yeah, the Olympics yeah. are going to go on there. I It'll think be it's fantastic. Be I think it will it's be. Fantastic. You were out of port, uh, out of time. Oh. Yes. Uh, You've got one more thing to say, haven't you? It's a plaisir to te voir ce matin. Buffon croissant, tous les mots, grand buffon. What does that mean? Well, he's just making up words about oh. hair, basically, and croissants. Yeah. And croissants, yeah. But very good. Yes. Very good. Au revoir. Thanks, Paul. Oh. Merci beaucoup. Ah. Yeah, we, need to get into the, we need to get into the swing of all this ahead we. of the Olympics, don't we? Yes, we do, yes. It's a beautiful language. It is. Very good. When it spoke properly. <laughs> yeah, 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 which none of us Not by do. Us. <laughs> no. Uh, now, do stay with us. We're going to be going through the papers next with Ella Whelan and Mike Buckley.
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Squatters in London have taken over a pub which is leased by Gordon Ramsay, no less. The pub is currently up for sale with a guide price of £30 million. Um, it is understood that Kitchen Nightmares host Ramsay called the police on Wednesday but was unable to have the squatters removed. The Metropolitan Police said in a statement they were made aware of squatters at a disused property but added, this is a civil matter and so police did not attend the property. Let's see what my panel make of this. Why can't we just boot squatters out? Out. If we own a property or lease property, why don't we just boot them out? I know that's tempting, but the fact yeah. is, long term empty properties have increased by 24% in the last six years. There's 1.2 million people on the social housing lists. People don't have a place to live. What it does highlight is the enormous. Um, disparity in fairness in property laws in this country. It's just not fair that if you've worked all your life and invested some money in property because, you know, interest rates at zero and there's nowhere else to invest your money, and then suddenly somebody who's got no claim to that property and doesn't seem to have earned very much in life takes over your property. It's an outrage. People shouldn't be squatting in people's, other people's homes or, or restaurants. commercial properties. But the fact is... Until we sort the housing problem in this country, none of this is going to go away. The, the fact is, people my age yeah. won't be able to buy a home unless they've got a bung from their parents. Yeah, but what's the practicality uh, uh, and... of this demonstration? It, it, uh, it's it, not a demonstration. It's not going to free I mean, up more housing for people who are no, on the streets. No, of course not. It? It's people looking to find a place to live. I don't think it's a demonstration at it, all. It, it, it's an anti-wealth, anti-property owning demonstration by people who've got nothing better to do in life than uh, <laughs> break into other people's property. <laughs> I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for me. My guest and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. The time is 8.47. Joining us to go through the papers this morning is former Labour advisor Mike Buckley and journalist and author Ella Whelan. Good to see you both this morning. Um, should we just touch upon the Israel-Iran situation, Ella, and your thoughts so far from what yes. we understand is happening? Yes, so, I mean, we understand that at the moment there's been no official statement from Israel. There's been... Um, well, both the Israel and the Pentagon, Israel and the Pentagon are refusing to make any statements at this point. Um, U.S. officials have told CBS News that there has been um, an attack. That there, Iran says that three um, missiles were it, it, drones were intercepted. There's no perceivable damage in Isfahan, where the Isfahan province, where um, the attacks allegedly happened. Iran is downplaying this quite heavily and mm. even suggesting that there is um, the potential that it wasn't Israel, that it was some other um, uh, people taking action, infiltrators is, is the word that's being thrown around. So we really don't know. What we do know is that Iran is saying it's unlikely there will be any retaliation. So the so anyone that's telling you World War Three or anything like that, don't listen to them. But that doesn't mean that this hasn't been significant. It's direct strikes between two nations that have previously acted um, through proxies. So uh, we sort of are just waiting to hear what the official line comes up with, particularly from Israel. Yeah, all right. Uh, well, let's park that one there, because we're doing so much on it this morning. Um, and, Mike, can we have a look at the eye this morning? Ofcom... Um, I don't know why it falls under the auspices of Ofcom, but they're concerned about the number of five- to seven-year-olds oh, who've got smartphones. 
They are. So that's gone up to nearly a quarter of five to seven year olds now with smartphones, many of them accessing um, things like WhatsApp and TikTok. And She's crazy. Like, it is completely crazy. Three and four year olds as well on smartphones and on tablets as well. I mean, you, you can imagine sticking a three or four year old in front of a tablet and putting them in front of well, that's you know, a nice thing, cartoon. Isn't it? Yeah. That's different to them having a smartphone being on social media. I mean, what are they doing being on social media at that age? Well, I have no need for so, it, do they? It's completely understandable that Ofcom and many others are concerned about this. And I think this is this is now an ongoing debate. What needs to be done to regulate smartphone access by by all children, you know, up to the age of up to the age of 17. And I was reading about this earlier, and I think a third of children aged between five and seventeen said said they'd seen something that made them concerned or frightened or something unpleasant, you know, on a smartphone or some other kind of device. And obviously this is going to be affecting their mental health, it's going to affect them growing. And there, are, there, there have been studies out. There's been one by an American um, researcher called Jonathan Haidt that apparently is influencing the government, you know, just indicating just the impact that this has on children's development and on their mental health, which is, of course, something that should concern well, all Well, I mean, we Lucy, Lucy Beresford on yesterday. She was talking about the way that studies show it, in effect, is rewiring the brain of young people. As, as a... As a young mum, mm -hmm. Ella, does it concern you? Thank you, you? for the young bit. <laughs> um, the... <laughs> Look, I don't think... I think most sensible people know that if you're sticking a kid at a very young age in front of things that aren't kid-appropriate, like social media apps and things like that, there's the potential for it to go wrong. But I actually think this anti-phones thing has gotten into moral panic territory. Jonathan Haidt's book on... Um, it, which basically says that it's, phones are killing kids. It's, it's, that's a crude um, sort of summary of it, but basically it is that extreme. Um, I think is doing quite serious damage to the concept of parental authority. And the government is suggesting banning mm. phones for under 16s. That is a that is an infringement into private family life and parental decisions that I completely reject. I think that we give a huge amount of power to these things, phones. Um, when in actual fact, what's going on is much more complicated. The right, for example, the rise in child mental health issues mm -hmm. is something that's really worth unpicking because you have an increase in reporting in things like anxiety or things like alleged um, ADHD um, diagnoses, which you know are the, they're worth unpicking. There's you know, the potential there that it's what seems to be happening, which is lots of kids are getting sick because of access to phones, isn't necessarily true. So I would just pour a huge amount of sort of scepticism on this. I'm not okay. convinced that this is the sort of new terror against kids that we that we seem to be thinking is. OK. Well, it's nice to have differing views. I don't know why I think about it, really. It's just... But there you go. I'm not a fan of social media. Mm. What should we go to next, Ellie? Well, I um, think, Mike, let's have a look oh. at, at the front page of the Mirror, shall we? And more on the Tory MP, Mark Menzies, who's now been suspended from the Tory party. He has been suspended, and he's not the first Tory MP to be suspended from the Tory party in recent weeks, although the last one, William Ragg, I think, suspended himself because the Tory party couldn't get around to it. So this is a, a strange and really rather sad tale, I suppose, recently. So it, it appears, um, it's alleged that this man... Um, uh, you know, middle-aged um, Conservative MP, been an MP for quite a long time, met a gentleman on a dating app, went to his flat, went to another flat where he was then incarcerated and told he needed to pay £5,000 to get out of the flat, phoned his 78-year-old former campaign manager and said, it's a life-or-death situation, I need £5,000 uh, now, you know, in a bit of an understandable... Well, perhaps understandably in a bit of a panic. This then happened... The campaign manager was then paid back out of Conservative Party campaign funds that had been donated in the gentleman's constituency and filed for campaign purposes. The concern, what is, this is awful. This person has obviously done something very, very silly. He's obviously then been blackmailed. Uh, so, and, there's the, and there's the misuse of funding. So there's that situation. But I think what should probably concern us more broadly is the fact that the Conservative Party leadership have known about this since January and done nothing. I mean, there is clearly an element of criminality here, an element of fraud. Obviously, this, he's been blackmailed by people that he was, you know, the MP referred to as bad people on the telephone. The Conservative Party leadership response to this is to do nothing at all, not to go to the police, not to remove the whip from the MP, just to leave things be and hope it would all just kind of pan out and be fine. Now, it's inevitably come to the light, and the Conservative Party is still saying they're not going to go to the police, which I find absolutely staggering. Uh, well, yeah, well, well, I don't know what to think. Well, I think, you know, the... I mean, whether it's the William Ragg case, which, you know, there's, I don't think anyone would um, judge MPs for having a private life on dating apps or whatever else and doing whatever they want in their own time. But the cowardice in that 
uh, in, it, did, the grinder stuff didn't bother me at all. It was the fact that he was he sacrificed his colleagues and his mm. and the details of his political comrades um, uh, because he was too worried about his personal, you know, understandably, but too worried about his personal life becoming public. That seems to me a total act of cowardice. And in the same way in a sort of different situation, the Menzies thing, you know, why would you not go to the police? Why would you not why would you yeah. not prioritize your professional life? There's there's sort of an element here of politicians now seem to be unwilling to engage with the fact that political life means an act of it is supposed to be an act of public service. It is supposed to be that you put your life, your the rest of your life on hold for this very important, perhaps the most important job in the country. Mm. And you know, I think we can all be sympathetic to people ending up in bad situations and I don't know how I would act in that, but I would hope that I would act differently if I had a public persona and a public duty as a politician well, in that way. Yes. Is clearly not acted in a sensible way, has he? I mean, it's one thing to have a private life, there's other things to be behaving like that in your mm. 50s, I would suggest. But anyway, yeah. um, it's been good to see you both. Ella, Mike, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you. Aidan McGibbon has weather. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome to the latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Rain clearing the southeast today, followed by further showers for many of us, accompanied by cool, blustery winds, although skies do brighten later in time for a sunny start to the weekend. Here's the picture by mid-morning, a lot of cloud on the map. Showers affecting many places, particularly central and eastern areas. Skies, though, do brighten across much of central and western Scotland and then later on, western parts of the rest of the UK. We keep the showers going through the Midlands, the southeast as well, accompanied by a cool and gusty wind. That's going to make it feel a little disappointing, I think, with highs of 12 to 15 Celsius. Nevertheless, the showers across central areas do fade away into the evening. The skies tend to clear as well and the wind eases. As a result, with lengthy clear skies, a lighter wind, Temperatures will fall through the night, touch of frost even as we begin Saturday. So gardeners beware, there will be some frostiness first thing, but there'll be plenty of bright skies as well. Lots of sunshine, lifting those temperatures fairly quickly through the morning. So if you're out and about first thing, it will soon warm up and there'll be plenty of sunshine until around the afternoon when the clouds will tend to build, particularly for central and northern parts of the country. And for the far north of Scotland, we're going to see some light outbreaks of rain move in here, making it feel cool. Elsewhere, with lighter winds, feeling pleasant enough. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. latest GB News Travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. In the Highland, the A862 is closed in both directions along Clackmahary Road at Scorgui in Inverness because of a fire. Buses replaced trains again today between Kilmarnock and Stranra after a fire. There are fairly shuttle train operating between Eyre and Prestwick Town. On the M62 in West Yorkshire, there's a lane closed eastbound after a vehicle caught fire between junctions 22 and 23 from Rishworth Moor to Huddersfield, causing queues. In Oxfordshire, the A420 is partly blocked eastbound between Watchfield and Farringdon, causing delays. Trains have been stopped westbound from Shoebury Nest to Pitsy after something got caught in the overhead wires. On the M25 in Kent, there's a lane closed clockwise where a lorry's broken down just off the junction 5 for the M26 with queues from junction 3 for the M20 and back on the M26 towards there. And in Cornwall, there's a report of a breakdown on the A38 at Double Boys. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. 
gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Arlen Foster on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good morning to you. It's nine o'clock on Friday the 19th of April. Today the world holds its breath as US sources claim Israel has launched an attack on Iran in a retaliatory strike. Reports of explosions near a military base in Isfahan. Earlier we spoke to the Work and Pension Secretary. Even at this stage, of course, this is an unconfirmed uh, situation, so we don't actually know precisely, and I certainly don't know uh, what has happened. But de escalation really has to be uh, the way forward. Iranian state media downplay the attack as the news agency claims the country's nuclear facilities are completely secure, as a senior commander tells them no damage was done. Well, a senior Iranian official claims there's no plan for an immediate retaliation, despite having warned of a severe and immediate response if Israel were to attack. Western governments tell its citizens to leave Israel over fears of a reprisal attack by Iran. In other news, Rishi Sunak pledges to end the sick note culture in Britain. You have 2.8 million people in the UK claiming long-term sickness and disability benefits. It's costing the government an absolute fortune and a crackdown is coming. I'll bring you the details shortly. It's going to be a sunny start to the weekend for many of us <laughs> as higher pressure finally arrives. But before we get there, today is another day of bright spells and showers. I'll have the full details in the forecast coming up shortly. Good morning, I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello, and this is Breakfast on GB News. Well, we've had breaking news all morning that Israel has reportedly launched an attack on Iran overnight in a retaliatory strike. Reports of explosions near a military base in Isfahan. But that's not coming from Israel, it's coming from US officials. Yes, the Iranian state media have been quick to downplay the situation, claiming that their air defence systems were able to destroy three drones in the centre of the country. Well, despite the pressure, Israeli officials are yet to make any statement about the attack whatsoever. Meanwhile, the Australian government have urged its citizens to leave Israel over fears of a revenge attack by Iran. Well, earlier we spoke to the Work and Pension Secretary, Mel Stride. It's clearly uh, an emerging story, so we don't know the full facts at this stage and Israel has yet to uh, confirm action or otherwise. Look, I'd make a few points here. I think one is that we firmly believe that Israel has a right uh, to self-defence. But at the same time, of course, what we have been impressing upon the Israeli government is the importance of de-escalation at this point. So whilst we don't know the details at the moment, uh, my hope is that whatever has happened is of a nature uh, where de-escalation can now be the way forward. And of course, we can continue then uh, to focus on the diplomatic work that we and others are doing to ensure that we get humanitarian aid into Gaza. 
Well, our security editor, Mark White, joins us now. And, Mark, bring us up to date on what we understand happened this morning. Well, we were certainly very concerned when the reports came through in the early hours of the morning that there had been strikes on Iranian, Iranian territory. Uh, but now, as it, the morning emerges, it appears that these strikes were limited in nature. You heard from Mel Stride there, and this will be the message from other Western leaders in the hours ahead, this key phrase, de-escalation. They're hoping that if this was uh, the full extent of this limited strike by Israel, we assume, although they have not yet publicly confirmed that, then that may leave uh, a, a way open for de-escalation and a hope that Iran feels that it doesn't need to respond uh, in the way that it had been threatening uh, with an immediate and massive attack. We've not seen an attack take place uh, in the hours since those strikes. Uh, so that bodes well, it seems. That doesn't mean that at some point Iran will not retaliate in some way, perhaps not from its own soil again, but from proxies in the region, the likes of southern uh, Lebanon or Iraq and Syria. Um, what is becoming a bit more clear is it seems that the strikes were conducted uh, from combat jets, Israeli combat jets, firing long-range missiles. Now, that will have been outside of Iranian airspace, probably in Syria, because we got reports from the Syrian state media that a number of air defence systems and early warning radars in Syria had been taken out by Israeli combat jets overnight as well. So that would have facilitated those aircraft being able to fire uh, from Syrian airspace just near the border with Iran. And those long-range missiles, we're told, were fired in tandem with some drones that were fired uh, from inside Iran. Uh, by who? We don't know exactly, but those drones... Uh, were designed, it seems, to keep those air defence systems busy uh, while the missiles did their job. The area that was attacked was Isfahan in central Iran. Um, it is a key area in terms of it's one of Iran's uh, biggest cities, but there are a number of military installations, air bases and alike around that area. There are nuclear facilities, although the, in the International Atomic Energy Agency says that no nuclear facilities have been targeted. Um, so, as I say, we await for official word from Israel, but uh, everything we're seeing seems to suggest that this strike was limited in nature. OK, Mark, thank you. Let's talk to former chairman of the Defence Select Committee, Tobias Elwood, who joins us now. It's good to see you again. What's your assessment of this on the basis that it looks like, as Mark was saying, it looks like it was Israeli and it looks like it was a very measured response and Iran itself is really playing it down. So what's your assessment of that? Yeah, I mean, so many questions here. We knew... This was coming. Israel has made it very clear that they were going to respond, looking at a number of options. But Mel Stride is absolutely right. This is all unconfirmed. We're relying on open source media at the moment. On the operational side, we don't know if this is a one-off, if Israel has concluded its attacks or if there's more to follow. But it does look like Israel's war cabinet has heeded the advice from Britain, from America and elsewhere not to retaliate on scale which would leave Iran no choice but to respond again, possibly closing down the Straits of Hormuz, which would have a huge knock-on impact to the world's economy. So still a lot of questions. The next 12 hours will be critical from that perspective. I would add strategically, the targets are interesting from, from my perspective. Um, Tabriz, which is in the northwest corner of Iran, this is where they fire the Shahab missile silos. This is where that base is, so very significant there. Um, and in Ashfahan, this is in uh, south of Tehran, this is very much Iran's nuclear activity. That's where all their research takes place. And there are reports that Iran is beginning to enrich uranium again at scale, up to 60 percent, with enough quantity for three sizable bombs. And it could be that they believe that only going by having a nuclear deterrent um, are they going to be able to fend off any conventional attacks. So a lot of big questions there. 
And that's perhaps worth her pondering on because whatever happens next, the rules of the game, this shadow war between Iran and Israel has completely changed with this direct attack. And of course, it glosses over something again, Mel Stride mentions of resolving the Gaza-Israel conflict, of getting that critical humanitarian aid in, getting the hostages out, and of course, walking, working towards a work, an agreeable security and governance structure for that particular corner of uh, the Middle East. I mean, the nuclear element of all of this is very concerning if we keep seeing these uh, tit-for-tat strikes, because both sides uh, demand the last word militarily, don't they? But we, we are open here, potentially, to coming down that ladder of escalation if, uh, if Iran denies this attack and, and continues trying to deflect attention away from it. But you're absolutely right there. The question for the West, though, which we've, I'm afraid, ignored for a couple of decades is how we've allowed Iran to develop such proxy influence, such leverage over the Middle East uh, in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Syria, in Iraq, and of course in Gaza as well. And that is the big nettle that we need to grasp. That's where Israel is frustrated that Iran has become so powerful that ultimately this was about to happen. This would have happened at some stage um, because we've not checked um, Iran's ability to, to cause such um, poison right across the Middle East, building up ever since 1979. Mm. Um, what is positive from the West's perspective on all of this is, as you said, that Benjamin Netanyahu appears to have listened to what uh, the White House has said. He appears to have listened to what David Cameron has said. And, and this being a measured attack, a measured, attack, a measured response... The issue he's going to have, though, and how concerned are you, that obviously there's going to be a lot of people to the right <clears throat> of his war cabinet who think this is just simply weak and it should have been a lot stronger. Yeah, you're right. We sometimes think that British politics is quite turbulent. Uh, it's very clear that what's going on in Israel itself is very, very difficult indeed. They've got this war cabinet, this coalition that's working at the moment, but we know that there's tensions within that war cabinet itself. We also have to recognize, or Israel must recognize, and I think they're appreciating that, not to alienate the international community. There was massive sympathy, global sympathy, after those barbaric Hamas attacks on the 7th of October, but that progressively evaporated because there wasn't a clear plan as to what sending in the military into Gaza was, was trying to actually achieve. And I think there's an effort now by Israel to make sure that does not happen again. There's a lot of big question marks, of course, as to how to deal with Iran, as I was touching on. I think you're going to see a very different approach if Donald Trump gets elected. Therefore, it's going to require some statecraft. And I think there's a role for Britain to play, certainly in its soft power, its relationship with the United States, its relationship with the Gulf nations, and indeed Israel, on trying to finesse our way through without allowing this to really escalate. OK, and in terms of what we can expect to happen next, should we be concerned about Iran's proxies in the region and perhaps uh, offences stepping up? Yeah, you're absolutely right. The one powerful operator in the Middle East that's yet to really show its colours is Hezbollah. This is the most powerful non-state actor in the world, armed to the teeth, and they've not really participated in the... Uh, Israel-Gaza conflict, nor got involved. There is some skirmishes, I should say that, from the Lebanese border into Israel, but nothing on the scale that they could move to, should they wish. And my concern has always been that Israel, Iran, that is always hesitant about attacking Israel directly. This is why this is unprecedented. Will they now lean on Hezbollah to do its part in destabilizing uh, what's going on, but particularly antagonizing and opening up a new flank for Israel and the West to be concerned about? Um, can I just take you back to what you said about Trump and if, if Trump gets back in the White House this year? Is that a point of concern or not? I mean, it's, it's very difficult to judge, isn't it? I mean, as to whether um, Iran, Tehran would be uh, frightened of Trump in the White House, would calm down because they don't know what his responses are likely to be. He's less predictable. Or, or, or could it inflame the tensions even further at a time when, when you say we are, we are trying to calm things down? I think all of that, and that's the worry, because we don't even know what he might do either. When he was in office, he did do something which people have forgotten, 
and that's to take out the head of the, uh, the Quds Force, the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard wing that is responsible for these proxy relationships. This uh, General Soleimani was, was killed, I think, in 2020 in Iraq when he was actually at the airport there. That was a drone strike there. That was the opportunity, though, for Donald Trump to then lean into this, but he chose not to. And as I say, we've allowed Iran to develop this strength. We do need to be more, I think, forthright, more purposeful in what our strategy is. That, I hope, is something that's been discussed in the back channels between Western capitals right now, because in this crisis, there is an opportunity to try and correct some of the uh, areas that, as I say, we've glossed over, we've allowed to develop. And don't forget, and I think I said this the last time we discussed this, what sits behind Iran, of course, is Russia. And Russia is, is benefiting from this because, of course, um, is distracted away from Ukraine. And things in Ukraine are not going well right now. Mm. OK, Tobias Howard, really good to talk to you. Thank you. Well, joining us now is freelance journalist Yotam Confino. Good to see you this morning, Yotam. Um, very interesting that we haven't heard anything from Israel on this yet. No confirmation that they were behind this strike. What can we read into that? I think, first of all, we should expect some sort of a statement coming from Netanyahu or from the, um, or from the defense minister. Um, they want to, to take responsibility for this. They don't want this to linger in the air. They don't want the speculation to just be, be out there. They want to say that they're behind it. So I assume we'll get something later in the day. We have heard already from uh, one of the nationalist ministers in Netanyahu's government, the security, national security minister, Itamar ben -Vir, who indirectly confirmed this attack. He just tweeted, lame. So, in other words, he's very unhappy with the military response, and he would know if Israel attacked. So, so I think we've gotten as close as we can to official confirmation. I've spoken to a couple of other uh, people, sources, ministers, and most people have said they cannot comment right now because they're all waiting for either Netanyahu or the defense minister to, to say something. Yeah, but how problematic is that going to be for Netanyahu, the fact that Ben Gavir is, is saying this has been a weak response? It is problematic for him because Netanyahu is trying to do the right thing here. Um, contrary to what many people think, Netanyahu is not a warmonger. In fact, he's very indecisive. He doesn't like conflicts. He, he drags things out. He doesn't want to make decisions about war. In fact, he called off a, a, an attack on Iran twice this week, according to sources. So I think that he's in a very difficult situation right now because he knows that there are certain ministers in his cabinet, such as Itamar ben -Bir, who will take advantage of this situation. They know they're smelling blood. They know that uh, Netanyahu's days are probably numbered. So they will try to capitalize on this and say, this is a completely, uh, it's a weak response. We should do much more. But at the end of the day, Netanyahu did the right thing. He listened to his allies, most notably the United States. He tried not to escalate the situation to a point where the whole region could blow up. And he's given Iran a way out. He's signaling to Iran, if you want to wrap this incident now, you can, because you can tell your public that this was a limited response. We can tell our public that we retaliated, and let's just call it a day. So he is giving Iran a way out, I think. And what do you make of the timing of all of this, Yotam? I mean, we've got the Passover next week, haven't we? Uh, it, was there a sense that, that Benjamin Netanyahu wanted this to be all done before that Jewish holiday? <laughs> yeah, I've heard that uh, report many times in the past couple of days. And I, and I have to say I'm a bit uh, surprised that, that it's become something that, that's being discussed so much. I think Israel is probably the country in the world with, with most high holidays. So if the military were to adjust its operations according to high holidays, it would be very difficult to maneuver. I honestly think that this was, either way, this was a matter of time before Israel would strike. They wanted to do it while they have momentum, while the, all the allies are behind Israel. They didn't want to wait too long. I don't think it had anything to do with Passover. I simply just think that they found the right time and the right target and, uh, and now they went ahead with it. OK. Uh, Yossam Confino in Israel. Good to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. Well, still to come, the government vows to crack down on sick note Britain. We'll tell you more next. 
I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. Men's mental health, yeah. men are starting to talk a lot more. Yeah. You've been through a lot of stuff that uh, people don't know about. Yeah, I mean, um, the last few years for me have been very, very difficult. Um, people, don't, people see me on tour, performing, making music. Um, but um, myself and my wife, um, you know, we went through... Um, two miscarriages, oh, um, wow. you know, and, you know, for us, that was a very devastating mm. course. time and very difficult to, to, to know how to kind of process those emotions. Mm. And I guess as a man, I, I did the thing of bottling up my emotions and where I feel comfortable to, to be able to express myself is in the studio, whereas, you know, she had obviously a different reaction to, you know, what happened to us because not only was it happening to her mentally, psychologically, but it was happening to her physically as well. And I think what something that she really w would wanted to see from me was that sensitivity and that emotion. And I thought that as a man, being strong was trying to bottle up my emotions and just show her that, no, mm. you know, that I'm, I'm being strong for her. Mm. But actually being strong was is talking about it. Mm. And what's happened ever since I've started to talk about it is I've spoken to more men that have experienced baby loss. My wife forced out of me, you know, how do you feel? And I end up as a mess on the floor. I was exasperating, yeah. crying, almost inconsolable. She was just holding me in her arms um, as we cried together, and we cried together. Um, and I didn't realise I needed that release so badly. Like I said, I've been able to speak to other men, and, and, and we've been able to cry together, and they've, they shared their own experiences, which they did similar to me. But actually, you know, as men, I feel like that conversation and that sensitivity and being able to be mm. emotional together... Every Saturday, 10 till 12, we'll bring you all of the news that you need to know. We'll also remind you that there is so much to smile about. It's my favourite time of the week. I get to relax, enjoy some lighthearted stories, and let Ellie teach me about fashion too. <laughs> That's Saturday Morning Live, every Saturday, 10 till 12. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Nigel Farage, and this is GB News, the people's channel. Britain's news channel. Nine twenty-one. Now there's still plenty of time to grab your chance to win a Greek cruise, travel goodies, and a ten thousand pound tax-free cash bank balance boost. Mm. <laughs> Here's all the details you need. Don't miss your chance to win our biggest prize so far. There's an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Plus, courtesy of Variety Cruises, a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With flights, meals, excursions and drinks included, your next holiday could be on us. Choose any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. We'll also send you packing with these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Yes, good luck indeed. Now, the Prime Minister has vowed to crack down on this culture of sick notes. So, Catherine Forster is live in Westminster now to tell us all about it. Very good morning to you, Catherine. And tell us more about these plans. Yes, so there is a crackdown on sickness benefits coming. We've had the Work and Pensions Secretary Mel Stride give us a little taster this morning. The Prime Minister is going to be making a big speech on this 
shortly, he's expected to say that he wants the focus to be on uh, what work you can do, not what you can't. He's also likely to say that he thinks uh, there's a risk of over medicalizing the everyday challenges and worries of life because there's been a huge surge in the number of people off on a uh, long term sick leave. It now stands at 2.8 million. That's up some 700,000 since the pandemic and a lot of those are related to mental health issues um, depression and anxiety specifically so the government is looking at uh, removing doctors from the process currently doctors are issuing some 11 million fit notes as they call them a year that number has doubled since 20 10 and 94 percent of people signed off in this way are signed off as being unfit to do any work at all the government thinks that's the wrong approach they are looking at um basically mel stride says some sort of one-stop shop where you would go and you would be assessed by a health professional and somebody linked to the benefits team who would work with you uh, initially to try to keep you in work if it was possible, um, if not uh, to support you and get you back to work. They stress the mental health benefits of that. But I think this is going to be much easier said than done. And they're already coming in for quite a lot of criticism. Yeah, that they are. Thank you very much, Catherine Forster, there in Westminster for us. And the Prime Minister is going to be speaking on that in the next five minutes or so, isn't he? He is, if he's on time. That is... Oh, there, and that's where he'll be. Uh, that's it from <laughs> us today. Up next is Britain's Newsroom with Pip and Ben. We will see you bright and early tomorrow morning. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello and welcome to the latest update from the Met Office for GB News. Rain clearing the southeast today, followed by further showers for many of us, accompanied by cool, blustery winds, although skies do brighten later in time for a sunny start to the weekend. Here's the picture by mid-morning, a lot of cloud on the map, showers affecting many places, particularly central and eastern areas. Skies, though, do brighten across much of central and western Scotland and then later on western parts of the rest of the UK. We keep the showers going through the Midlands, the southeast as well, accompanied by a cool and gusty wind. That's going to make it feel a little disappointing, I think, with highs of 12 to 15 Celsius. Nevertheless, the showers across central areas do fade away into the evening. The skies tend to clear as well and the wind eases. As a result, with lengthy clear skies, a lighter wind, temperatures will fall through the night such a frost even as we begin Saturday so gardeners beware there will be some frostiness first thing but there'll be plenty of bright skies as well lots of sunshine lifting those temperatures fairly quickly through the morning so if you're out and about first thing it will soon warm up and there'll be plenty of sunshine until around the afternoon when the clouds will tend to build particularly for 